Okay, another uh, information gathering is uh, from the International Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team to, to put uh, on uh, internet uh, free uh, alerts. Uh, we uh, we start uh, develop, developing uh, uh, a device. This is a Raspberry Pi. Oh, yes. This is a Raspberry Pi with uh, a Honeypot uh, software, which uh, we want uh, to 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 change it to make uh, active defense. There's been a fight back. We have uh, this uh, already in places, and uh, we are uh, gathering uh, terabytes with uh, attacks. Well, not at least uh, we want to to put in in function a uh, security operation center to defend. Uh, SCADA and uh, IoT, and uh, if uh, anybody wants to collaborate with uh, us, I uh, invite you to send an email because uh, we start working uh, with uh, uh, developers uh, to implement uh, function uh, in uh, CMs because uh, in this time. Uh, all the security incidents, event management uh, don't have uh, don't have the the Scala and the IoT um, function. If you have a question, please. If not, uh, thank you very much for your attention and. Uh, once more, uh, excuse my bad English. And uh, please feel free to contact me <coughs> if you have a question. Anybody? Anybody? No? No question? You don't like my presentation? No. Oh. Claudio, please. What's the most interesting thing that you have discovered? The most interesting? Teams with uh, with Scala or uh, IoT. The most interesting. The most. Uh, I don't understand your question exactly. The most interesting or the most uh, money gathering because uh, some. About fun or it's about fun. Because uh, I, uh, I explain to you. Think about the uh, uh, petroleum sea tanks with uh, tons and hundreds of tons uh, with uh, with diesel. And uh, think about uh, uh, we have this uh, and uh, we. Uh, Put uh, all the petrol in the sea. Is this funny or not? Yes, it's possible to, to change, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if it, it is possible, yes, but uh, I do I do this, but uh, it's uh, in FDA. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> like I told you, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, another question? With pleasure. No? Ask me everything. 
Yes, yes. Uh, to protect it, to protect it, it's hard to explain because I'm not a tester and uh, <laughs> my expertise, <laughs> my expertise is uh, to penetrate, not uh, not to protect. But uh, it's interesting question and. Uh, and uh, I, uh, with uh, my colleagues, I will start to put together uh, this uh, security operations sector, and uh, maybe we will develop uh, guidelines uh, and uh, share fee to, to protect us, if, if somebody pays, if not, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, my presentation today 
discusses uh, how to make the best out of your application security solution. Um, it's generally split into two parts. I'll present myself. I'll uh, discuss uh, some information about application security solutions. We'll review the different solutions. Uh, can everyone hear me? Just say yes. Oh, great, great. So we'll review the different solutions that uh, are available in the market with pros, their cons. I'll review a bit more about static analysis because that's what I know best and what we do. Um, and then we're going for a bit more fun. Um, we're going to have a game. We're going to have a short game that you can all join. You can all see your results on the screen uh, if everything works properly. So if you have your cell phones, your laptops, Get them ready for the second half of this presentation and uh, we'll have some fun. Um, if we have a bit more time, I'll go through one or two um, potential risks with Node.js. Node.js is a new platform framework that is uh, very popular nowadays. And uh, I think we can just start. So I look for check marks. My name is Amit, Amit Oshibel. Um, we do static analysis, security testing. So we actually analyze source code applications, web applications, mobile applications, um, to detect any vulnerabilities within the application and allow the developers uh, to resolve problems. <coughs> We've been in the market for a while already, since 2006. Um, we have hundreds of customers uh, globally, um, also in this area, um, and our the main point that our customers point out is that we have amazing, amazing, amazing support. Um, but that's not what we're here. We're here to discuss some other stuff. So, does anyone, can anyone guess what this number on the screen means? 37 million. Does it ring a bell to anyone? Now? 37 million records have been stolen from Ashley Madison's website. I actually have some of them on my laptop here. Um, that was one breach that happened a while ago, uh, not very long ago, a few months ago. 5.6 million? Anyone? Was in the news like this week? OPM. 5.6 million. Have been stolen. So it's fingerprints, it's not even passwords or personal identifiable information, it's fingerprints, so it's very strong information. And one last one 40 million, 40 million credit card information were stolen from Target. On top of that, 70 million data files have been stolen from Target just last year. These are just three examples of, of the application security breaches that we're seeing lately um, in the news. Of course, there were others um, globally. A lot of them are concentrated in the USA, but there are also ones that are happening in Europe. Um, and it's just growing. The problem is just growing all the time. These are more examples. This is actually a graph that you can all see on uh, our website called Information is Beautiful. Um, it constantly updates. We have a lot of graphs, not all of them security related, um, but in this case, you see the largest data breaches that have been going on lately. Um, and it's quite amazing, the numbers are, are impressive. So, what in terms of security is really our problem? Why are we seeing more breaches and what's the difference than you know, five or ten years ago? Um, Systems, all these network parameter um, security solutions, protocols to block uh, supports, to block sources. But what happens when the port is okay? Um, the source is fine and the protocol is perfect. So it's, uh, not, nothing bad with the protocol. What about the transaction data itself? In this case, what happens is that the perimeter security firewall, the RDS, doesn't see any problem with the, with the transaction and it will let it through. And that's where web application firewalls jump in. Also, web 
the Bishop Firewall in a second. <coughs> Some statistics and some information 90% of applications are vulnerable in one way or another. Okay, that's information that I didn't make up. It's from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, the network level is not designed to protect the application level. Okay, most attacks today are happening on the application level. Um, most of the applications today are built to run on web, on routers, which also increase the vulnerability level, increase the threats that are available because of the browser themselves. And the attacks are not like uh, 15 years ago where someone would attack your computer to show you how to break down your computer and now you can't do anything yet. That's actually to make money, um, make money, steal data. It all comes down to um, getting money in the end. So they're very quiet, they're very stealth. If you have been attacked, you probably won't know it only a few months later when you see your, uh, either your personal bank account or your organizational data has leaked into the internet. So um, this slide here shows the development lifecycle, a standard software development lifecycle where you start with the product design, you move on to the development, as the equipment and you go all the way to production. Each one of these stages has its own um, application security solution. <laughs> and if we look through them, at the beginning you have a uh, security requirement when you design the product, you might have threat modeling, things like that. Later on when you start development, which I see is included for peace, um, you have static analysis. And uh, during testing, you have dynamic analysis, uh, interactive analysis, and uh, static analysis also works in testing stage. Later on, usually during deployment, not always, either during testing or during deployment, you will have a pen testing stage um, where the pen testers will come in, try to break down your application and see if they can map anything, if they can break anything, and then you go back and fix it. Firewalls, um, which are on the perimeter during production, or runtime application security protection, protection, which is a new technology um, that is just emerging and uh, is part of the application itself, doing something similar to what application firewalls. We'll discuss that in a second. What application firewalls? You have uh, web application firewalls actually what they do is they block access or detect attacks based on their pattern. Um, they detect the session, they sit on the perimeter, and they try to detect SQL injections, uh, things like that. When the request is legitimate, it will let the request in. In terms of its ups and downs, there are some problems with that web application firewall. Um, how many of you, by the way, use web application firewalls? Not many at the moment. A few. Okay. Um, from my experience and from people I've spoken to, most companies who use web application firewalls usually have it on alert mode and not on protection mode, not on block mode. The reason for that is that web application firewalls have a high rate of false positives. Um, of course, you need uh, someone to review the data and decide if it's right or wrong, so you need to employ some more security uh, analysts. Upsides actually are the fact that it can protect in real time, you can really block the transaction. Um, and developers love it. They love it because they have nothing to do with it. They don't need to do anything, they don't need to check their code, they don't need to. It's not up to them at all, it's only with the security things. The next uh, application security tools are dynamic analysis and integration testing. Um, what this actually means, and Logan was here before, he's a penetration tester, um, and he actually comes in and breaks down everything that he can to show the organization that there's a problem. Um, very similar with that dynamic analysis is that you run, a, you run a piece of software that attacks the application and tries to detect all kinds of different breaches. 
Um, these two tools uh, or solutions are similar in one way. Sometimes you will see that inflation testers using dynamic analysis, um, other times you won't. Uh, some organizations use dynamic analysis only, some use penetration testing. Um, if you look things about penetration testing and uh, dynamic analysis, you don't need the source code. It's a black box test. It can be a black box test. <laughs> um, the analysis is both on the client and on the server side. Um, it exposes the vulnerabilities in real time, so actually what's happening in real time um, can detect that. And it can expose vulnerabilities in third parties, which are not necessarily your own code. The problem with uh, dynamic analysis, for example, is uh, the fact that it cannot detect um, non-reflective uh, vulnerabilities or attacks. So, for example, if I run my dynamic analysis tool and I try to delete a file within the software, um, and I was successful, there is no response from the software, so I don't know if there's a vulnerability there or not. Um, false positives, again, it might miss minor uh, or less visited areas of the application. It requires, and this is a very central point for all application security solutions, it requires a full application, it requires a running application. So if we think back about the development lifecycle that we saw, it will test at the stage of deployment or production. So it's a, the latest stage in the application security development, in the application development, sorry. Um, therefore, it's very difficult to work with it in agile methodologies. If you're using agile, you want things to be done quickly, um, and you can't wait for the full build to be ready in order to run the protection or the detection. It also doesn't tell you where to fix the problem. So it will tell you there's a problem here. It doesn't tell you how to fix the problem itself, in most cases. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, penetration testing is a very important tool, also um, can be very comprehensive. It analyzes both the client and the server side. It has a very strong upside that it's based on human, human logic. So, we saw Vakan before me, um, he seems to me like a great penetration tester. He has a lot of intelligence, he knows how to do stuff. But on the other hand, some penetration testers are not as good as others. So, you're actually getting a service based on the quality of the person that's providing the service. Um, it's a long process, and again, it happens only at the end of the development life cycle. So, IAST, IAST is Interactive Application Security Testing. It's a completing solution to dynamic analysis. Um, it sits within the application itself. And when a dynamic analysis tool is attacking, it will communicate with that dynamic analysis tool to give it some more information. For example, it allows detection of non-reflective vulnerability. And why do I have this picture on here? Because it's actually like someone knocking on the door and the IAS will answer from within if there's a problem or not. Upside and downside again. So it allows test solutions to do some more detection. And may, in some cases, you, it will give you the specific line of code where the problem resides. Um, the problems with it is that it cannot live on its own. Um, it's very weak on its own. It has to be integrated into the application itself. And uh, there's a potential for false positives or detection. The last one before we get to static analysis is runtime analysis security protection or real time analysis security protection, which is actually, a, I see it as kind of a replacement for web application firewalls. The reason is that it does similar functionality in similar stage of the application as web application firewalls, but it's part of the application. So, what happens actually if you have, for example, a regular SQL injection? string, it will go through to the web application where the REST is located. The REST will then analyze the data flow of the application. So within the application flow, it understands the logic and the data flow of the application. If it sees that it goes back to the output to the screen, it will let it through. Uh, 
Um, even though it's a pattern, as if it's not doing any SQL injection, it's not going to the database. However, if it is going to the database, it will block it. So that's a new technology that is really emerging now in the market. We're seeing more and more people um, taking it up, um, not necessarily yet replacing web application firewalls, but <laughs> it does have the potential to do so in the long term. It's upside, it has no false, almost no false positives because it is in the application and understand the logic. Um, it can block in real time. It's transparent to the user as uh, it should, actually, depending on the method that you're using, but it should have a negligible uh, performance impact on your application. And it integrates with uh, static analysis, so you can communicate with the static analysis and tell the developer where, where the problem is. Um, the downside, on the other hand, is that it requires instrumentation into the application itself, so it becomes part of your application. Many customers or many development houses prefer not to integrate third-party protections into their application, but that's uh, something that has to has to be resolved. Um, and it's implemented in your production, which you can either see as a downside or an upside, um, as long as it doesn't have an impact on your production environment. I see it as an upside. Static analysis. Um, that's the one that I want to concentrate on. So the idea of static analysis is to take the code in the, developers, in the development stage and be able to analyze the code before it goes all the way to the production stage. Um, once you analyze the code at this stage, it's easier for the developer to fix. It's cheaper for the organization. I'll show you a graph showing that in a few, in a few seconds. Um, and it's much faster to resolve. So total overall is that once you scan your code during the development stage, your return on investment or your total cost of ownership is much lower than any other solution where you have to go at a later stage. So in terms of the upside and downside, I mentioned some of them. You fix the vulnerabilities at their source. The vulnerabilities are created by developers and can be fixed by the developers. Um, We'll get to that in a few minutes. Let's see how much time we have. Okay, we're good. Um, but it's very important to keep that in mind. The developers are the source for vulnerabilities, and they are the source to fix the vulnerabilities, and that's what we're trying to, to get to. Um, in many cases, there's no need to compile the code. You know, can actually run the code even compile There's no dependencies. Um, it will show you exactly where to fix the location and how to fix, where to fix the vulnerability and how to fix the vulnerability. Um, it can fit into waterfall uh, methodology, development methodology, it can fit into agile development methodology, um, into sprints, uh, scrum, whatever you want. It doesn't affect the production environment, of course, and it provides education. Education is the second part of this session. We'll get to it in a few seconds. Um, but education, again, is key, and I think this is more or less what OWASP is all about. Um, it does have false positives. There are ways to reduce the false positives. Um, it sometimes may report findings that are not exploitable. There, there is a vulnerability in the code, but it's not exploitable. And it doesn't run during the application runtime, so it doesn't block any attacks during the runtime. This graph is taken from uh, web access, from a report they released, and you can see the differences of the probability to the The blue is uh, client side, the blue is client side, and the red is server side. You can see that on the white box. On white box, the detection of the probability is much higher. And on this black area here, all of these are false negatives, so missed detections using black box technology. When I refer to black box, I mean dynamic analysis, I mean, uh, um, in some cases, penetration testing, in other cases, penetration can be great testing, can be white box services. But when you don't have a code in front of you, 
when you don't have the application in front of you and you're testing your application, you risk missing a lot of data. This class is actually, I believe it was created by, I'm uh, not sure it was created by OWASP themselves. I don't remember right now, but I'll check that. Um, and it shows from left to right the stages of development where most vulnerabilities are created. Obviously, during the coding stage, you see 85% of the vulnerabilities created. And you see that the cost of fixing the vulnerabilities grows as you go further in the development stage. So fixing a vulnerability during the coding stage, according to this research, costs about $25. But the developers, they're already, <coughs> they see the, the vulnerability and say, oh, that's a piece of code that I just wrote, let me write it differently, it's easy. The more further on you go into the process, the more difficult it becomes. Obviously, when you release your product and you had a breach, it can go up to millions of dollars. Um, but even before that, if you want to resolve a problem during QA, for example, you have to go back to the developer, you have to find the developer who did the code, you have, you have to remember, and it's now moved on to a different project already. So there's a lot of things to consider when developing, when detecting vulnerabilities, um, and when you would want to detect your vulnerabilities. Um, the costs, just some examples of why it becomes more expensive. So when you're at the development stage and you've done your static analysis, um, you, are, you only need to fix the code itself. Later on, when you're after release, you have to consider the application, you have to consider delays in the application, um, development efforts, of course, the impact so how did it affect the different teams? How did it affect your QA team, your development team, your security team, your IT, Dev DevOps, and anyone else? And the further on you go, of course, I don't want to talk about after being breached, because then you have all the legal costs and everything else that can really go up to millions. And we're seeing organizations losing millions of dollars over um, breaches that were detected um, after they released the product. There's a conflict. These two guys, one of them is the security person and one of them is the developer. Um, in this case, she is the developer and she says, hey, I need to release this application. I can't wait for your security process. I can't wait for you to now start running um, analysis on my code or give it back to me after I've finished everything and have it fixed. On the other, on the other hand, the asset uh, has to validate that he's not releasing a uh, piece of application, a piece of software with vulnerabilities in it. So again, going back, where do we fix those vulnerabilities? What's the ideal point of fixing these vulnerabilities? It would be during the development stage, where the developers are involved, and the process is cheaper, simpler, and faster. A few points regarding source code analysis or static analysis. Um, a few important points about what you would want to see in your source code analysis solution. First of all, you would want it to integrate into your development lifecycle um, so that your developers can use it. Um, on one hand, you don't want it to be pain, you don't want it to be difficult for the developers. On the other hand, you do want them to learn, you do want them to use it. So we want to integrate the SDLC in developers' IDE, the bug tracking mechanism, the build servers, anywhere you want. Um, and uh, you want to uh, um, go through this list. Uh, you don't want to depend on external service level agreements, you know, so penetration testers or services that are external. Um, you want to have the ability to provide the best way to fix the vulnerability for the developer. I just got a note that we have 10 minutes left. I <coughs> probably we'll add a bit, bit more, but okay. Um, so the last point of thing here before we jump to the next stage, which is the fun stage, is that you want to educate your teams. Static analysis allows you, allows your developers to get education while they're doing their work. And this is actually something that we did. Um, Game of Hacks 
is a tool or a game that you can go online and see it. Um, it does actually uh, quickly show it on the screen because we don't have a lot of time. Um, you have an online game, you choose your level, you start playing, you can play against each other or on, on yourself, with yourself. You get a piece of code and you have to choose which which vulnerability appears in the code. Okay? So you get five questions, you select the right one, in this case I selected the wrong one, and you go on, so on and so forth. Now, we believe that this method of education is very important. It's part of, of getting security out there in the field. And uh, actually, it's an idea we came up when we saw in a conference. We saw a bunch of people standing in front of a board with a vulnerability in it trying to detect it. I'm going to jump through these next slides because uh, I want to get to the game itself. Because we don't have enough time. <coughs> I'll send you all the slides later. But if you have your cell phones, your smartphones, your mobile phones, if you log in to kahoot.it right now, we can start a quick game once you log in. And you know what? I'll throw in a t shirt for the first place so that you guys will play. Something like this. I'm going to see people joining, if you join. If you don't join, we're not going to start the game. And we'll just keep on like a boring lecture. What's so different? Okay. 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 Come on, guys. I did this at Def Con and had 150 people join the game. It was a lot of fun.
Don't know how many of you are developers in here. So the developers speak at this. I don't think we have them. Okay, I'm running quickly because we're out of time. Okay, a chance for some extra points. Which one is Tom? <laughs> Is it mouse or cat? <coughs> okay. You all got it right, I think. Excellent. I'll be your backup. <laughs> okay, another vulnerability. Good luck with this one. It's becoming tough. <coughs> Uh, kind of a marketing campaign. 
But we quickly understood that it has a lot of potential behind it to attract actors, to attract people, to play, uh, and to break down the games. And this is actually really what happened. So we built a honey pot um, out of the game. It was, it was both an educational tool for people who want to learn application security, and the honey pot was allowed us to understand what happened and how they're trying to hack it. Um, because obviously, when you put up a thing that has to do with hacking, you automatically get all of the guys, but also some of the bad guys coming in. This is actually really what happened. Um, we saw people starting talking in different uh, uh, forums about uh, the game, and uh, someone said that the game itself was harder than to hack it. Um, and it was hacked. It was hacks uh, or vulnerabilities that we on purpose left within the application so we can see how the hackers react to it. Um, Another person said it tries to teach security but fails at security. Um, ironically, it's easy to hack a game about finding security games. And this is all very nice. We had a lot of different um, attacks, which we fixed along the way to get, the, to get to make it more difficult on the hackers and to get more information from the hackers. Um, the game was based on the Node.js, um, where we had the server side with MongoDB and the client side, which runs on mobile and, uh, and PC browsers, as you can see. Um, Node.js, single-threaded, very cool framework to use. We're seeing more and more. It's very fast uh, and responsive. Um, the way I like to explain it is actually like that. We have a single thread at the cashier um, getting requests. And that's the, the whole theory behind Node.js. And that single thread is in charge of the living just taking these requests and asking people to do the job for it. So it is always free to do more things. Therefore, that single thread is very fast, as long as he doesn't have to do heavy calculations. Once the single thread has to do heavy calculations, you have a potential for uh, slowness. And then you have a potential for denial of service. That's one of the demos that I wanted to show you. But I guess in another time, um, the idea of Node.js is to keep the single thread with easy, easy um, data, input-output functionality, and not have it do heavy calculation. <coughs> Once it does the heavy calculation, it will run slow, it will use the full CPU, and it will uh, it can easily create a denial of service. So these are just some of the things that you can detect during static analysis. Um, for example, if you're writing Node.js and the static analysis solution is scanning your code, it detects that it's running not correctly and there's a potential for uh, vulnerabilities such as uh, that may for the denial of service. The developer will immediately get information about that and be able to um, uh, fix it in real time. Okay, um, we don't have time for the rest, so we'll leave you for some questions. Um, are there any questions from anyone? No questions at all. <laughs> the next slide? This one? <coughs> the list of? For now, GS? There's not a full list of recommendations. What I was going to show is a demo that shows how we can run a, a denial of service in real time. Um, but obviously, there is a, a, a product or static analysis are not based on a list of rules. So we build rules or we have preset the rules to detect vulnerabilities. And then we can see all the, um, the rules, the policies, why you can reach one of them. And when something is detected, of course, you get the information about how to fix it, what, what, what's the, what the problem is, and what would be the ideal way to fix it. More questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you were an attacker or someone that wants to break an application, what would you, what would you do uh, on two options? One is to do a penetration test from the outside, and the other would be to find a way to get some source of the analysis. So, so as an attacker, I'm not 
actually the opposite from both and he's an epidemic protector. Um, but but I'm not, penetration testing is important. Um, penetration testing, we use most of our customers, which are static code analysis uh, customers, with our product, do penetration testing also. However, what we see is that when you employ static analysis on your code, the amount of penetration testing that you need reduces significantly. So you have much, much less penetration testing resources spent if you analyze your code beforehand. Does that address your question? Did you ask them on a practical point of view? Not really. Yeah, but basically, which is similar, which which would you think is simpler? To, to attack with or to protect with? Uh, to attack with. Um, <laughs> usually attackers don't have a code. So attackers usually will run on black box. Um, and they will try to run vulnerabilities to run maybe dynamic uh, tools, maybe penetration testing tools. Um, but what I'm saying is that if you protect your code, these dynamic tools will not be able to detect vulnerabilities because they won't be able so, so nowadays there is a trend that uh, developers use different frameworks, libraries, and everything in the new development in order to you know, reduce the development that code and like So how does static application security tests and tools can manage this? Because it's not necessary that the developer, piece of code the developer might will have a vulnerability. It might be from the library he's importing, it might be from the framework he's using. So, yeah, so how does such can manage this issue? How we can overcome to find these issues and report the issues to the developer? I mean, you know, because so, you're asking actually about the framework? Yes, it might have some other abilities. I completely agree with you. Um, and static analysis is there to test the code itself. Um, and, you know, I've, I've worked for three different security companies. Each one of them does something different, and each one of them is critical. I do think that static analysis is the first piece that you want to put when you're building your own code. But I also think that you need to have more than one solution to protect yourself. So yeah, static analysis will read the code. Um, there are some places where you can also read binary with static analysis. Um, mobile binaries and uh, web application binaries. But you will want to be able to detect your third parties, to analyze your third parties, and there are um, solutions for that as well. Also, the SAS findings, I believe it's different some tools it's an application that I So, uh, how you can make it more accurate? Because in the task, you will at least be taking out from and comparing if it is a reason. The SAS maybe the SAS developer or the rule maker may not write a proper rule of it. It might make a force positive violate or it may not find I mean, You yes. might expect that you find lots of anomalies using that. But if you don't have the rule in the system, how do we know the situation? That's correct. So part of the responsibility of a vendor that, uh, that develops standard <coughs> solutions is to create presets based on rules that are critical for the as much as possible. Now saying that, every company develops differently. Every developer has their own technique of development. Um, and therefore, static analysis solutions should also be a simple way to put additional queries. So what we do in our case is that we have the presets in the system, a whole lot of presets for ECI, for mobile, for whatever for whatever you want to think about. But on top of that, we have a query language that we develop that allows the, the organization to set their own settings or their own rules detection in addition to the presets that are already available. Okay. Thank you. Oh, one more question. Which is the most secure operating system from your point of view? Ah, it's a good question. 
Well, you know, instinctively, most people would say iOS, but I don't agree with that. Um, other people would say Linux. Everyone would say that Windows and Android are not secure. Um, however, what I think, from my point of view, I don't think any one of them is, is secure. I think they're all of them more or less the same. The question is adoption. The more people use a specific operating system, the more it will be hacked. Um, you can also see that with PC and mobile. So once most of the apps were on PC, and we're seeing slowly shift to mobile because more users are now using mobile. There's more cash, more money in mobile. So it shifts all the time. It depends what you're attacking, and a good actor will tell you you can attack Windows, you can attack Linux, you can attack iOS, depending what you prefer to do at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Je kunt wel wifi's wel om te schrijven wifi's. Je kunt wel parola. Je kunt wel kunnen schrijven parola. Nou, stel dat het zeer plat is, dit is dat. Ik kan zeer plat zijn streaming, als je dat kan aan het aantal dat niet meer. Ah, dus je kunt ook via wifi via streaming direct naar. Ja. Ah, oké. Ik kan zo dat zeer plat zijn. Ja, oké. Ik ben er. 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 Da, dar l-am pus-o eu. Live. Nu, nu, nu. 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 Da, se vadă spunsul de live. Da, păi asta. Păi nu mai găsi laptopul tău și îl puteți să descarce. Să le-ai dublești și să le-ai dublești. Asta e live acum, nu? Da, nu e live acum asta. Nu e live acum asta, că eu am dat share. Nu știu. Și Cătălina a pus-o pe asta, deci era mea e live. A, ok. A, păi nu se spate. Nu, altă lăgă. Nu, altă lăgă. Thank <laughs> you. 
Și pe care? A, ah, ok. Asta dacă nu vede camera, nu are cum să ia microfonul. Am înțeles. Da, pot, Ce scrie? Puteți să-i dați minimă, să nu stau să fie Vedeam live cum merge. Ah, Asta era. Da. Da, văd de fapt. Și acum eu văd cu tot cu baga asta? Acum da, dar acum să-l fac full screen. Uh-huh. În fapt, așa nu se mai vede. Uh-huh. Și, și asta se... Da, da. Nu, și asta, asta nu cred că se vede, că stă un pic până uh-huh. dacă nu e mouse-ul se vede. Uh-huh. Tot s-a pus să-l dai record. Uh, să văd că atunci când e secțiunea de întrebări și răspunsuri, s-a scamă de către cel care întreabă. Ok, în start, Robin Speaker is Daniel Tomescu, în continuare și 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 în 
Amazon will fix an error for something. If not, you can just browse the web page and do the source code. Source code. The HTML is really close to so Excel. Um, Excel family has a lot of components and a lot of parsers. Basically, every uh, language, programming language, has a uh, few libraries for the parser in Excel. So there are, there are a lot of parsers. XML can be used in uh, web applications, and there are some here are examples. Uh, XML procedure uh, files uh, have uh, inputs XML files. Uh, service oriented applications are based on XML. Colors and speeds, again, XML. Uh, also, XML is uh, used a lot in uh, document and in annotating uh, documents, like uh, uh, for the uh, office suite and the uh, inputs. Uh, they are really uh, easy to, to parse by mobile devices and uh, some choice. Also, by creating uh, mobile applications, examiners are used in configuration patterns in the markup, in markup for the interface, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's really something. Okay, so we have a lot of components. And uh, the interaction between each component is uh, somewhat complex. Uh, a programmer can uh, easily lose track of uh, what happens and the one to his master does exactly. Uh, from time to time, some uh, parts of errors may occur from negligence or I don't know. And uh, when uh, errors happen, uh, that comes to uh, security problems. So, from uh, what this is a classic example of an authentication bypass in SQL injection. And uh, if you are using your external files, I will not save from the external files. That does exactly the same thing. Any questions? <coughs> uh, another classic vulnerability from OWASP to 10 is uh, process leaking. Uh, in the example above, we have one uh, reflected process leaking. Uh, the value is reflected from a get parameter, but uh, we can achieve uh, approximately the same effect by posting an uh, XML file that contains uh, an equivalent payload. Okay, about uh, it's basically a duplicated uh, technology. Uh, it uh, describes uh, the XML, uh, XML document, the one from the one from above is the XML document, and the one from below is the XML. Tell the parser what the XML uh, looks like, what the nodes to expect and what kind of modes. Uh, but the interesting part is uh, that it is accept uh, external entities. This means that uh, using a DTD you can request a file from the server and uh, import that file into your external uh, XML payload. <coughs> so, a simple example. Let's say that we are uh, John and uh, John uh, Jan uh, is trying to update his profile on uh, social media or web application. So what does Jan do? He just makes a file request to the server. This is the request. The server goes to the file system and uh, requires this simple file. And uh, it places this file inside an XML, XML payload. After that, the application will proceed and uh, store the file that it, it read from, from the server and it will store it in the database. So, John can now go to the web application, view or get his profile, and uh, he will not see his last name, he will see the, the content of uh, the very file. Which is pretty nice. We can basically read files from the server, 
in Yotaro. Is this somewhat here? Okay. Um, if not, don't worry, I have a little demo about this. So things might get a little bit better. Okay, so what do we do when we cannot see the output in the web application interface? Uh, we, we can get an error of, uh, that contains the content of the uh, uh, external LTD. We can see it in the application, but can do, we can send it to our website using, using the out of band attack. Basically, on the, the green line, we request the file from the server. And on the red line, we send uh, that file to our um, website. Be nice. And after that, we can read the file from our website. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, what you do, you create one entity and then create another entity uh, and you define it as 10 times the first entity. And the third entity has done 10 times the second entity and so on. And you end up creating an XML bound. When you try to include the last entity, the parser will go and ask, please, row 9. Then it's 10 times row 8, uh, and so on. So this kind of request can uh, consume a lot of resources from the server, uh, quite a lot of computation power. Uh, basically, request lasts about uh, 2 minutes and uh, consumes uh, more than 3 gigabytes of RAM. So you can imagine that with, uh, I don't know, 10 requests like that, you can put down on a uh, strong web server, which is a nice of service. And uh, we have some variations for, uh, for external bounds. The first variation, we take just two entities, and uh, the first we define as being the second, and the second as so the parser is really confused and try to create and create and create entities until and uh, another variation we just create a really big entity and we include it uh, multiple times in our XML file so it will break the uh, the next part of the denial of service using the XML uh, that you did is it uh, that they can be stopped very really easy. For example, in you know, C sharp code, you can do this by writing a simple line of code. This settings uh, is that uh, a specific number of uh, characters from external entities. I have a short demo of this data. Okay, uh, another really nice step is uh, to make a server side request for Julie. So, basically, what uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to request the file from the internal network, not, not from uh, the file system, uh, like that. And uh, when uh, the request is made, uh, Let's just imagine that we have a really vulnerable application that on this request will delete all the users, but the application cannot be directly accessed from the internet in the local network somewhere. But if this request is made from the file server, uh, the application will be deleted the users. So here is the schema for this. We are here in the internet. Our request will get saved through the firewall, so basic request, nothing official about it. The file server can then go and request an entity from the internet, if, if that's what we are doing. But for the while the firewalls and other controls are in the internet. So this can be really handy in our penetration list. Uh, from a place where you don't have uh, access to data networks and uh, probably mass of secure applications, you can, uh, you can get and uh, do quite a lot of things. Uh, are there any questions about ETDs? Do I want something like that? Okay. Uh, 
for you to work in the schema. So I stated earlier that the uh, DPs are uh, deprecated. So something must take, it, take uh, its place. The, this something should be in the XML schema. It basically tells us uh, even more information about uh, the XML. We can see that uh, I know the body is defined as being a string, and uh, the parcel we will expect our XML to have uh, a body element uh, of type string. And this is just a report there, in the iPhone. So, uh, server file request for JS can still be uh, introduced using the XML schemas. <laughs> for example, we can define uh, secondary name places for uh, schema allocations, and uh, now to use the same for the schemas, and the uh, request might be made. Uh, this mic is uh, really influenced uh, by the external parcel. Some external parcels only really take into consideration what uh, it's in health, some others do. So maybe you don't like it. External schema poisoning attack. Uh, basically, if your payload uh, contains an uh, external schema, you can try and uh, confuse the parcel hard enough uh, to give you back some uh, interesting error messages. For example, if in our payload we don't put this uh, body to be else, we put it to be date, time, or whatever or something, our parcel will expect it to be integral. Uh, or anything else. And uh, it will give us most probably an error. And in error messages, you will see later on there can be some juicy information. <laughs> okay, what do XML start? So, XMLs are often used for uh, storing content. Let's say we have a really simple uh, application that does not need to connect to a database to store uh, some books. But uh, we still need to search for that uh, XML file. And uh, here comes the uh, interface. Yes? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so a uh, quick tutorial to say that. The first line will request the first book from the bookstore. The second line will request the titles of all the books from the bookstore with the price greater than. Uh, the report will request all the books with the uh, language, uh, all the title books with the language set to English. And the last one, all the, the last book from the bookstore. It's pretty with your first line uh, because somehow in some words we store as well as second line. So we have uh, because the line is your injection, we can still have a different injection. So then what happens? Uh, we try to log into one application, and the application stores uh, the login credentials in the XML file. Uh, to query the XML file, uh, we can use this path, and uh, we can go in, into a server side uh, language. We can create a XPath string by concatenating the request username and password to the other values. So, uh, for the username Mike with a password I know anything or something too. And this is uh, again uh, authentication bias. Okay, about the uh, content type better. Uh, basically applications, web applications should uh, make a match between, between the content type and uh, the uh, Post data. So if we have content type application JSON, we should post on JSON. And uh, if we have uh, application XML, we should post application XML. Um, in this first one years, the web was uh, using a lot of XML. Recently, it's uh, getting to use a lot of uh, JSON. 
So the analytics and the executive uh, allowed us to make uh, external requests, but by uh, the is JSON. So when we receive the traffic, we don't see external requests, but we can just change the content type later and the application respect to an external. Okay, so how can this be used? Well, we have an application probably is not secured for XML attacks because it's not really using XML. Uh, but if you if we make a site, we might get some of this stuff from the server. Uh, still no questions? Somebody? Yeah, please. <coughs> Uh, the specific user is the user uh, website, so it could be Apache or something else. And Apache should have at least a great file. Okay, uh, fair enough, but uh, Apache is not the only server, <laughs> and uh, others do have rights. And uh, this one definition, you only know Apache can might allow us to make requests. And uh, even if we generate uh, anything from the file system, we can still make to request to the internal network or to the web, uh, depending on uh, what, uh, what is our interest. <coughs> okay, next is the demo. So we have cluster fingers, because things might not work. So, this demo is about uh, public non vulnerability. Uh, just to read the description, the IPT function before submission used by own cloud, own cloud server before some other questions. Uh, allow remote attackers to read arbitrary files, cause a denial of service, and possibly have other impact transfers. So, the uh, funny thing is that uh, the same function is uh, used by WordPress. So, okay, if you work here, the last edition of uh, WASP, you probably know that the edition should have uh, something about WordPress and uh, it's bulletproof <laughs> security. So, yeah, this demo will be on, uh, on another version of WordPress. And this one I mean, can be reproduced on everything up to 3.9.1. I will make this demo on 3.9.1 to put this. Okay, so the demo is uh, for the version. Okay, uh, we have quite a lot of references. And uh, yeah, it was posted one, posted one year ago. Uh, just to tell you a little bit what can be done with this. Um, yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, our process is uh, uploading a new media file. Uh, really quick how this is done. We select a media file like uh, a song or something. And uh, it is uh, about it in our WordPress. So, to see how the media file looks like, um, it's just gibberish until the yeah. end. This is quite a remote that, not uh, something. Okay, in the end, we have an XML file that uh, describes uh, the meta information from the file, different things. So, uh, XML. As an input, we can get creative. So, for the first example, uh, we will try to read one, uh, one file from our file system, so a.txt, and to show you the real contents. Okay, so it's a simple text. We can try to read it. Okay. Select any file, this is our payload, and voila, the error message. So it says they have some problems passing the file data and here is the content. Pretty nice. But okay, 
can we can we get the config file? Well, let's try. This is uh, the second example. So basically, the same payload. Uh, the request for the config config.php file, which should contain some more interesting information like uh, database username and uh, password. Any questions? Why right not? Okay. Uh, maybe I'm okay. Second example. So we still get the error message, but it says something else. And it doesn't give us anything. Trust me, I searched a lot. Uh, so we have to be a bit more creative than that. Let's try our third example. So, you see, we still try to request uh, this file, but uh, use an PHP filter to convert the value into base for. Uh, why we was that uh, the format of uh, the config file was breaking something that uh, External parcel. So, by importing uh, it into base form, we have only letters. Uh, so, we should be safe. <coughs> okay. Let's try this really quick. We have our message appeared, and we have our error message containing some basis for. Let's just open this and record it. We can use some extension or anything else. Okay, so this is a part of the config file. It says the database name and the database user. Maybe I can guess the database user, not that hard. But uh, I still need a password. Uh, so let's see how can we get all the file, not just uh, not just a password. <laughs> For this, uh, I've made the third example. We can get even more creative than that. Uh, this is an out of band attack. Basically, I am going to re request an. Uh, External file from my domain, and I'll show you a little bit what is on that domain. Because for the same uh, file, uh, it still converts it to base 64, uh, but after the file is loaded, um, so it's sent to my domain. So I, I'm not expecting to see the output in the uh, message, but to uh, find it in my domain. So the, the log file is this one, when we left TXT. By the way, if you are on the internet, you can check the real time that is not a scam or something. Okay, so this file is empty. And uh, when we try to to parse, we still get an error message. This time we get a lot more useful information uh, with my log file. So let's pass this real quick. Oh, it's not. Uh, Okay, so we have the database password, which should be pretty strong, but not against those kind of attacks. We get the authenticity key and uh, more, but it's still not the entire file. Uh, the entire uh, VP config file is uh, sent to my domain, and uh, by decoding all this uh, basic support, 
which is container policy. So this is a good example of uh, how WordPress can be hacked by somebody that uh, has rights wanting to upload a media file to the server. And uh, the, the attacker can now connect, well, he can now connect to the server database. Okay. Uh, questions? Yeah, please. Have you tried that doing the same thing without <coughs> error reporting on? Uh, well, uh, when I saw the press, it was on my report. I'm not sure why. But the uh, auto band uh, attacks will most certainly work uh, even if error reporting is uh, off. So it was uh, probably it was useful for me to have that. But, uh, so it's not the one that we Thank you. Other questions? Okay, uh, does anybody want to see an example form at all? Yes. Okay. Uh, for this, I made a quite long time ago, a simple uh, application. It, it doesn't do very much, but uh, it so allows me to browse for an external file and uh, it will display it in a trivial manner. So the external file is parsed and uh, then showed in the replace. Okay, pretty nice. Not very useful, but it's an application. So when we search this application, the external bomb, uh, it will Okay, so you can't see much, but let's just look at the resources. Okay, this is not responding, and just watch the memory that it uses. It's slowly, slowly growing. It will get uh, up to 5 gigabytes of uh, RAM if we long enough. And uh, until it does so, I'm going to show you the code behind the, the, the application. It's a simple C-sharp application, not intensive. Here it is. Okay, in the back example, this uh, line of code, simple line of code, was uh, not there. I'm rotating on an external reader and read uh, the file. And uh, after that, I'm processing the file that I need. Without uh, the simple line of code, uh, the application is not able to do uh, external bound with the text. Okay. Back to our processes. I can do. I think I can show you better than this. Okay, so we slow it down. Uh, in a few minutes, it should be uh, get to more than two gigabytes. Uh, any questions? <coughs> yeah, please. Um, how fast uh, does it uh, grow into RAM if it's uh, using more LLs? <laughs> uh, I think the problem is the processing power of my laptop, not, not the modification. So, how uh, uh, <coughs> Well, if, if we use uh, more of another NTP and uh, include the uh, last one 10 times more, it will use uh, 10 times uh, more time. So, this is the relationship. Uh, however, until we get there, we have to wait quite a lot of time because uh, this is a laptop, not, not a server, and uh, we get the uh, story. That's why I was asking because uh, there's a curve. No, I, I think uh, the problem is the uh, processing power of, uh, uh, used by the process. So I don't have any address in my application. I, I have only one process that uses about 24% uh, of the CPU. And the parser is to wait. Okay, other questions? Okay, uh, before I close my presentation,
So with only part of the request, you can put down the you could in the past put down the, the server. So yeah, that was about it. Any questions? Okay, I have a uh, few goals to give. Uh, I'll see you later. Okay, thank you.
So yeah, um, so to everyone. Uh, my name is Alex, and today I will present uh, my talk about GraphNet security. So actually, I changed my name recently, and now it's called Not that that involves a uh, graphic marketing, but actually, if you follow the hashtag, you will be able to see my latest results, which I found out. So I made some research and a few days ago. Um, I found some other interesting details, which I will present actually. So, um, well, we're talking about darknet. You know, it's quite a fancy word. And every time you hear that, you might be guessing that probably the presentation is going to be quite shitty. So, I hope that today's will not be one of those. And uh, I will try to do more practical details talk about that and the results, which I was able to do. Um, I'm currently uh, a professional chapter leader and uh, also I'm an organizer of Twitter uh, and that. So thank you all for joining me today. And uh, a few words before we actually start the program dark web. Well, as I said, this is a constant work and so far there are a lot of uh, definitions of that. So. Uh, you can actually read it, of course, on the slide, but uh, what is important here is that in the first line of the definition, you can see that there is thing which is the definition. Actually, subjects on the dark net are secure and anonymous. By subjects, I actually understand by users, which are there to hide their uh, tracks to browse and Instagram to something, and also servers which are on the dark net as well. So there are some servers, and so theoretically, if you don't have the right address, they are anonymous, and you can't do anything to run the kind of data that you have there. Um, so I guess everybody heard by 2015 about that, so I will not go into much details about how it works so on the very basis of the error. So yeah, it's related to technology and uh, the IT node will show a different IP address to uh, the <coughs> So, yeah, this is very simple. And uh, when we're talking about dark and the next one about dark on the internet, there are a lot of speculations about that. So, some people say that uh, dark is completely secure and anonymous. And of course, it's not true. Some people say that you know, it, uh, you should not use dark at all. And, or at all because uh, it's not anonymous and there are a lot of attacks. This is not exactly true either. And uh, when preparing my presentation, I was actually I actually saw that article on uh, by the ground and I decided to quote it here. So it says that uh, unfortunately for print seekers, almost all the sites <coughs> on the internet are fake. What I can say that uh, during my research I was able to see that in fact. In many cases, it is true. So, um, for example, well, who you actually use this sort of browser response? And who you did for dark purposes? Nuclear <laughs> <laughs> market or Alphabet or some others. Basically, these are like dark markets where you can buy some. Illegal stuff, and they were completely, uh, they were successfully closed and seized by the FBI. In fact. However, if you navigate to the Tor browser right now and try to look for those, you will be able to find, I don't know, like tens or, or I don't know, maybe hundreds of such uh, markets there, and they are not functioning anymore. However, this is just a simple vision. And uh, one thing which was very interesting to me is that. On some websites, it's like you have the login and password field, and uh, some guys just enter their credentials and they are simply logged in the clear text in the file on the server. And it's only down to actually the anonymous 
efforts, uh, which, I, which I heard and decided that probably there, are a lot of, there is actually room for research. And uh, in fact, yeah, I agree with the article which I put there. So also, although it's triggered by in many, many ways, uh, you still can find some quite quite interesting and sometimes sometimes it is illegal stuff. So yeah, of course there are uh, things about criminals, about drugs, about violence, everything. And although you are of course able to find it on the internet as well. People sometimes think that, uh, okay, we are on the dark net, we are more <coughs> secure, more anonymous, and everything. Um, so, talking about attacks, well, of course, there is quite a huge amount of them already. And, uh, well, in certain conditions, it is possible to somehow minimize users. However, none of the attacks is able to be completed. And uh, no attacks here are, for example, in the middle, where you are able to actually uh, to traffic of uh, someone's with a desert node and you see what, what he does. Or it might be, for example, traffic confirmation or correlation attacks. Also, it is believed that attacks like exploits against computers <coughs> or flash were used by uh, NBI to anonymize some big issues in Tor. And of course, there are some vulnerable protocols, so if you use, I don't know, like, it's our over, over target, most likely you're going to be optimized. Um, so, since I work as an administration tester, mostly with web applications, my approach was uh, quite web application security way, was done in such a way that I was trying to look for general upside vulnerabilities. And uh, talking I decided to low risk of information disclosure. So I believe there are quite uh, there is quite a number of penetration testers and uh, you know that when you find information disclosure, most likely it's gonna be like low risk and nobody would really care about that. Well somebody maybe maybe they change their configuration some not, but in general okay you found the make address to care. However, in, in dark night, that can be a game over for someone privacy. So basically, when you are there, your goal is to hide your, your uh, identity and to, to uh, pretend that you have a different IP address and you know the real one, then it might be a problem. And of course, this is not a unique idea. There were some researchers on that, and I have to mention that, of course, too. So <coughs> one of them, for example, was a uh, research from Edgar and Wade. Uh, they use their fun spider uh, to actually must scan the dark web and figure out the basic outcomes of that. So first, that uh, hidden service conditions are really secure. Uh, second, hidden services are not able to attack, and so the of security is, is decreased. And third, that of course, when you use existing hidden services. <coughs> And if we just think about those results, well, it's actually quite logical that uh, such web applications are more secure. Um, those are comparing those which are considered really at the highest risk. And in fact, when we're talking about uh, some application, generally it's one two pages, sometimes it's just WordPress or any other quick made thing, which uh, normally does not have to contain such a So uh, of congestion in their one page website, but well, it might happen. But uh, as a general, it, it won't happen, and so this is actually the result. Um, also, of course, I have to, to mention the code. So, there is an amazing blog that was set, and uh, when preparing the presentation, I was actually pointed out that there was another uh, blog post about that. So, here it is. If I wouldn't um, <coughs> mention it here, they would do that for me again. So, I decided to do it on the safe side at that time. And uh, how it all started? Well, uh, just imagine that you are the one who would like to start such research to minimize somebody or, well, the subject on the darkness. Well, the first thing which you would uh, try to do is like an instant win. Of course, if there is something like a or server, 
that was for Spanish immediately. And there's a nice set of uh, thousands of uh, the most popular internet services. And uh, here is the statistic for such instant vulnerabilities. So for each info, I will find 10 out of 1,000, that makes 1%. And the reflection of it, yeah, generally it is very instant. Sometimes I remember <coughs> that was something like the, uh, the line where it could you be able to see on the screenshot. But in some cases, it was really a big info, and yes. Somebody actually really good that on your person. Uh, the learning server usually was about zero percent, so in fact that was just one uh, out of thousand, and I consider it as an exception. Well, instantly uh, it works in a way, but ten out of thousand it was still not my goal, and I wanted to go for that. Um, there is any That uh, there is a IP address, and on the same IP address, there is a clear net and some dark net services. Generally, it is considered a bad practice, and you will see actually that many times today, and even if you read any, any guide on how to set up your other dark net service, that would be like in red, it would be letters like you should not do that. However, people still do that, and one example here is just that it is really enough just to. This is some IP address, and in some cases, it will be just direct redirection to uh, hidden services, which is like you can see on an implementation. So, that was the first surprise for me. I was like, hmm, come on. So, it is like, it is not just to, for example, scan a range of IP addresses and parse the results of the application, and you already have uh, quite a number of, uh, of such anonymized hidden services. For that. So, if you are as late as me, you, are, you can actually check and just shut down. And of course, you've heard about that. And uh, if you just search for Omnium, in some cases, you will be able just to see the IP address. You also follow that and you again see the uh, target uh, service in there. Actually, there was quite a number of them, and it's, its number has decreased, and it's actually given a bit of so time. So when I when I should contact one of the guys, he told me like yes, this is my contact. However, you need to do it better than just launching your script. Okay, I decided that we probably I had to do it better. Um, of course, there is uh, what I was talking about. That is like general aspect approach. So here, this is completely nothing really new. So yeah, very simple. Sequel injections again, common injections, and other injections, and everything. And again, the results of that error and were actually showing that yes, of course it happens, and in some cases you will be able to execute common server or on both your shell or whatever. Uh, but it's rather not common, and uh, I mean, it can happen everywhere. So, yes, of course, if you have such access to the server, you're able to help them in the Still, it was not like the Muslim organization it was like rather. Or other individual effects. And then one should think, um, maybe, one, maybe wonder what, what the hell is going on here. So, apart from those instant links with uh, server impact issue, there is a uh, server status. And for that, I took already a set of my parent rate with uh, 7,000 of the uh, most common, what, let's say it, it is considered as known dark net. So in one day, there is about 7,000 of live servers, of live services. And uh, in time, some of them die, some of them appear, but check out how possible about that. So I took a set of 7,000, and to my surprise, uh, about 7%, which makes 500 of them, uh, were vulnerable. And uh, we cannot consider that as instant win, actually, because we will see later in lots that you will, and you will be able to see on the blog posts. Uh, one However, it already gives some information, and in fact, that was my guide to the darknet. So before that research, I just heard about that, I used it a couple of times, but I had no real idea about how it is structured, what it was defined there, and uh, I was just basically relying on such articles which I mentioned in the beginning. And so I wanted to check myself. Um, as you can see, actually, such big 
<laughs> so that was not just you know like some sweet services which were made by I don't know some materials. However, that were what those for example which had like up over two terabytes of traffic in less than a month for those which were like like more than ten years. So um, it made me wonder. And I went further. Uh, as I said, that was like a guide to internet to me. So some of them actually gave me an idea on what is going on in there. So if you again use the dark net, there are certain variations of dark people, and one of them is like that one people. And uh, as you might guess, it, it was also vulnerable. So in fact, it, it does not uh, give me any opportunity to completely <coughs> my client server or its users. However, it can be used for well, I didn't put the whole screenshot here, but actually the internet really seems to be dark sometimes, especially when you see what people are searching for in there. And, um, well, as I said, I started the general uh, approach, and also in my blog post, I mentioned that um, about 2% of the non dark net is controlled by one population. <coughs> In fact, the year that the, uh, the number was about 5%, it was about 350 services. And uh, one organization in that case was just a housing service. So imagine that you are the guy who would like to hide his identity, who would like to, I don't know, put some probably illegal content in there. And some guys are actually using dark net housing services. Um, in my understanding, this is quite a bad practice even for your net. So there is are very can be acceptable. Yes, everything. But nobody guarantees you that on the dark net you already have a secure hosting server. And uh, in that case, it was completely insecure. So, in fact, all the 350 services which were in there uh, we were affected. So, I was able to see all the traffic on all the services, all 350. And uh, this is one approach I would like to show you how one uh, is able to actually dynamize the whole hosting. And <laughs> if, I could, if you'd be like, I don't know, whatever, if you'd be, uh, you could actually just, just see them as easy as, as it is. So, again, the problem was here that uh, there is a clear next uh, IP address, so general server, which is accessible over normal internet, and there is a hidden service. And on their IP address, as revealed later, it was a simple to us. So it seems that they have to okay, trust, but who cares? However, when you start to monitor this server status information, um, you can see that uh, it is a yeah, double house, as we were able to see already. So, like it was here on the left side. So, IP addresses uh, are not uh, uh, shown in there. However, it is shown when somebody accesses the IP address on the internet. So I started to monitor the problem to find something interesting in there, some accesses, probably admin panel or whatever. And uh, suddenly I mentioned that there, I noticed that there was a box scanner. So over the internet, there is a quite a huge amount of such uh, bots which uh, scan your servers for some information, like the general. Vulnerabilities, some security or other vulnerabilities, and uh, in there. And I thought, well, if I had my own scanner, how would it work? And uh, immediately I realized that if me as a then advisor access that IP address, I would be able to see both my IP address and the request which I had. So there is already a number of uh, such scanners. Uh, some of them are, for example, ZMA uh, of one American university, or there is Mascan, and there are actually other departments. And all we need to do is just to somehow um, change that in a way that it not just accesses every address with a session with no uh, request to the root. However, you have just to modify it uh, in a way that it accesses the API address and uh, tries to obtain the file which has exactly the same IP address it accesses to. So basically access would be like XXX, which is like a IP address, slash and again, it's a IP address. 
and not to do much such a dark and monitor of that. And as you might guess, if you on my scanner, I hope the ID is just a better pattern to slash. So, like that, in a half of half of hour, I was able to actually then find the huge person which had at that moment more than 10 gigabytes per day. Um, of course, it's not just uh, about servers, it's also about clients. And uh, as we've already to see, it's not uh, possible directly to do it by somebody when he accesses uh, the uh, hidden service, because again, the address would be like otherwise. However, there are general vulnerabilities again, which might help you to do that. And in that case, uh, there was a full authentication scheme where he was uh, made as a unique identifier. And uh, here is again a uh, name and here is the request. And uh, in that uh, in that authentication scheme, he is used as a parameter with the identifier for exactly your worker. So it's quite easy to guess what happens next. All you need to do is just follow exactly the same thing. And well, sorry, from the URL table to see that, but I will come into this. So here is again our uh, domain. Here is our pull request. And here are all the order details. <coughs> so actually, the Bitcoin address, where, which was used to pay for such services, here is the exact amount. And as you know, actually, you're able to see that uh, on blockchain doesn't over any similar website. And uh, here is all the customer information, like uh, um, email address, like telephone number. So actually, it also works surprisingly and quite many times. I didn't exploit it all the times, of course. I just wanted to check on this surprisingly important. Well, you might wonder uh, that, okay, there are files, and of course, uh, they exist everywhere. So, I think probably there are some better something than just simple to uh, for images. Well, there are some, and uh, one of those is uh, Rise Up. Uh, Did anybody hear about Rise Up yet? Okay. So, uh, Rise Up is actually a secure email provider for the darknet. No? Just the dark net actually exists everywhere. However, they also had uh, their hidden services in dark net. And uh, when you actually register your account, which is, a, which is in fact quite hard to, to do because you need to have two invites to that from two different people. So when you finally uh, we get to uh, reach it states like uh, this is a wonderful thing and we don't provide like, much storage for them. But we have uh, individual features, and those is actually we do not we do not have internet addresses of anyone who utilizes a uh, message service, including email. And on their official website, it is possible to actually see that since 2012, there is quite a number of uh, hidden services for all kinds of their normal services. And as you might guess, and as you can actually see on the side, all of them are also affected to the server status. And um, before I let you show you, I wanted to tell you about the model which they use. So basically, they have three types of accounts served by security level. So this is green account, it's like a lot of this, Wikipedia. And uh, something that's interesting. This is red account, uh, which is used for exactly what uh, most users use in there. So this is email, this is chat, open again, and also some other. And like, which is like a completely new one. So I decided to concentrate mostly on red and black accounts because uh, rings just do not seem to have uh, much importance in terms of privacy. And the first time I was able to see that on a red account, uh, when you access actually user rise up net, it is possible to see all the activity which is done by the user. So you register your username, and this is unique and uh, Generally, you cannot just change it. And uh, by monitoring uh, server, the service which was uh, on the same host as user as I was able to see all the activity of the user. Well, it's not that much, but it's something. 
important to have a bit more information against that. So even if you're uh, the one in the middle, and if, even if you can see the traffic, uh, basically it, it uses just the hash of, uh, of your username with uh, certain parameters, and you are not able to correlate the activities of the user and uh, uh, the user himself. However, if you're uh, during the authentication, still uh, the sessions are put in there, so this is my username, and here is the hash which is used later. So again, if I uh, intercept your hash this month, and if I was able to see the, the session authentication scheme, then probably I would be able to relate all the activities on the email with your hash. However, the most interesting for me was uh, again on the red account that in fact uh, remote IP address was not and this is for all the activities uh, of the user, there are some blocks of the devices, like here. You can see that uh, here is everybody like uh, one of those. However, in here, this is real IP address, as well as here, a block of activity for this IP address, and so on. So, in fact, I was able first to make sure that my IP address also appears in there, and then I actually realized that it's not just IP address. It's not just any activity. It's also, for example, clear text uh, email accounts which are used in there. So that already might me think that probably it is not that secure. So of course I uh, edited uh, notified them and now it only goes this is however still since it was like uh, 2012 I think probably was not the first to uh, found that. Well there is another um, example in here which is like a uh, megaphone which is one of the largest Russian of operators and in that case it was set up all so as you can see, actually the traffic here is also quite impressive. So they have uh, 1.3 terabytes uh, in just a few days. And uh, in here again, you are able to see general user activity with uh, mobile phones. So as you remember, there are certain attacks, for example, to track the user to see what he does and uh, everything. By just uh, uh, setting service status, you are still able to see, uh, for example, the Mobile phone here, the IP address which is used, and again, the IP is like uh, what ID is used and uh, what, what actually is the user does here. However, again, uh, authentication schemes is also not the <coughs> example of excellence in the case, and uh, you are also able to see a clear text about the and password to the one of the domains. So I had Breaking the system, however, uh, log analysis has shown that other systems is very likely to be And in fact, uh, such samples was really a huge amount. I was, I was uh, honestly surprised how many of them uh, were vulnerable. And uh, it actually was quite, quite surprising, you know, it's just not something which has <coughs> okay service has. Everybody knows that it is a fail, and but there should be a reason why it is like that. And uh, then I just started to look at how it works, what are the configuration files and everything. And uh, at some point, when I actually opened the configuration of that account, uh, I was able to, you know, really catch the example here. Um, so in fact, this is a very tiny one, and I guess you already get the idea of why it happens. So remember, I was talking that um, in the loss, you are not able to see the IP address of the team server side of the server. It is shown as the uh, 127 And what we can see actually in Apache is that it allows us to go uh, and it allows us to see its comments, for example, for instance, it's for server status when the request is made from a lot of And well, it might sound okay, it happens. However, if you just stop for a second and just think about it, so all the connections from local host to Apache in the case are allowed just because it is uh, considered as um, reliable. So, what, what can happen if something accesses it from local host? Right? However, however, then 
Jim was the guy of 2012, and uh, there was a guy, uh, R.C. Muscle. Um, according to his bio, he was not a hacker or a tester, he was just a developer. And uh, he was playing with the experiments for Heather, and he was a bit a lot of houses. Uh, and this is actually his book, which is named How I Had to the Stack of the uh, If you mind, I will just read what he wrote from there. So, this new menu item was named Admin. Here is a click the link where I immediately denied access, and what happened next surprised me. Not only was I not denied access, but I was transferred to full access to everything. I had the developer console to see what people were doing. I had a database where interface where I could directly write in the database that I wanted. <coughs> and then I said to the chat. And again, when you just stop and think about it, in fact, we have a sort of before by default. So it means when you over over to our in the dark net, every hidden service you access, you have that access from local host. So any security measures which are done uh, based on IP address on local host IP address are automatically bypassed. And trust model here really seems to be overlooked. So, uh, just with the period muscle, I was also able to find some services which uh, generally are not uh, accessible by the internet. However, in internet, I was able just to go there and, yeah, home sweet home, where I was able to uh, do some various ways to test out for the unit because I'm very able. And uh, as I said, it's not just about uh, communication by bus. Actually, it's about any security measure which is based on any address. So, the most of the things on the internet actually use uh, PHP. And if you ever saw the manual on how PHP session ID is generated, it actually contains the most like So, the uh, really is also possible to attend all the sessions just when you know the timestamp and you just prefer that. Also, such security measures like fund detection, like push or open house, or any other, if you need authentication by us, of course, uh, apply in here. And uh, I was thinking how to finish my presentation and I was not able to find anything better than just to point out to the tour project. It might be very vulnerable as well, and every time when you connect to the Tor, most likely you're going to use Tor browser, so it makes a request to Tor project check Tor project or really use your uh, Tor correctly. And uh, if it's not, it will say, it will tell you that uh, sorry, you are not using that, otherwise it will say everything is fine. However, all the IP addresses are also uh, logged here, so then uh, uh, at that point it was possible just to visit that page and see everybody who was connecting to the tower in, in here. So, in fact, this is it. So, thank you very much for your attention to this. And I hope you do get more of this. Thank you. How do you compare the vulnerabilities of Tor and Freenet? They are the most commonly used by uh, the Yes. Uh, so I was not, I do not have enough uh, results to talk about it right now. So hopefully you will see the next talk. Okay, they just want to make sure they don't seem very vulnerable with the uh, Tor controlling the net um, Excuse me? They both seem very vulnerable. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just it was about the application or it was about the Yeah, that's, that's but right. yeah, it is right. That was used uh, and then down to the road. Yeah, my baby guy. Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, so in here I just wanted to show that uh, sometimes you just even need to have access to know and have uh, many materials. It's just enough to be a bit curious and to try to, you know, uh, just. Well, 
I have a question. If you have a room balancer, something like NGX or a batch, yeah. is a, a multi server uh, architecture behind it, like Google for a lot of patching and something like that, and uh, some of them are running for local posts, we could buy back in the same way. On the governments, if you would like to have your own balancer and your architecture on the back. Yes. So everything behind the load balancer is if it trusts by default to the log post. In fact, again, all the security measures which you have for log posts are going to be by default, just like that. However, I just to know why would you use this on a human service? A human service? Maybe you really want to do something that bad. But I don't recommend to the Thank you. Um, yeah, again, I just wanted to point that uh, probably today I will increase my changes and be more in the So, thank you again. If you have any other questions, just have a nice day.
Dominion company. Uh, we have a security operations center for managed services that we have in San Francisco. Uh, traditionally, at security events, the, the sexiest demonstration of the box are about the attack, right? This is the cool stuff. You find some clever uh, way of getting inside either a clever exploit or clever technique and get in. You find out the customer or the victim how bad the security is. The problem is that somebody has to take care of the defense as well. And this is the boring stuff. This is the Cinderella stuff. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is our, actually our job. This is what we do. Uh, our background is in the security technology, uh, and we embrace this because it's also a complex problem. Uh, and uh, as I'll point out later on, uh, attack and defense are asymmetric. Uh, and uh, it's really, really, really hard to do, uh, to keep us a high level of, of security and defense. Uh, in, in companies. So, my proposal is to touch on these points. To look a little bit at, at this asymmetry, uh, to present our view of a structured defense approach uh, and best practices, and to touch a little bit on uh, legacy points. Imagine that in serious companies, most of the time we do a penetration testing where we just fool around and, and, and play. There is actually a incident response team behind it uh, that has to, uh, to take serious all kinds of events. Because it may be just a researcher or a student playing out with some tool, it may be a uh, state mission or a sponsored group or a separate attack going to into the network. So, uh, doing a incident response is really also a quite exciting job. Uh, Many people that uh, uh, bells and whistle and fireworks like pen testing when you manage to get in on you know, the task to, to crack a server, it's also uh, by challenging. So let's look a little bit at attack versus defense. Here, uh, unfortunately, the, I, I can say just the one sentence. Uh, the defense is already lost. So when we look, for instance, at the uh, zero day dynamics, we see it. Uh, uh, a growing market, exploding market, and probably some of you that have uh, black belt reverse engineering and coding skills already uh, fancy of uh, explain development because it's a booming market. You may spend around six months uh, trying to work out uh, an exploit. As you have it, there you go, 20k, 50k, whatever. So it's quite a lot of money uh, if you have the skill. Uh, but it's not always about this kind of uh, complex attacks. But, uh, and the, the, my point is, uh, the phenomenon already uh, is out of control, the, the race is lost. Uh, there is quite a wide window of, uh, of exploitation for uh, zero days, and, and the post disclosure uh, amplification is huge. It's like, uh, 180,000 uh, 80, 80, times. Larger than the data centers, the data numbers. Also, the median uh, uh, time for response is about 200 days. That is most of the response time on the average, 143 days. Basically, it means we don't know anything that happens there. Uh, and also, just to skip the numbers and get to, to some, some points I want to make. Most of the time, 94% of the time, it's a third party that tells you, hey, you have some uh, incident in, in the network. So if we look at these numbers, these numbers are uh, for a study to get uh, large corporations, because this is something we need to, to take into consideration when we look at this kind of studies. What we see is that defense is terribly lucky. And uh, uh, one of the major uh, Enemies in the defense actually complexity. It's also the processes, it's also the discipline of implementing the best practices, and how to touch on them. But also, it's really some common sense. Because uh, if, I don't know, 84% of, of the accounts, uh, of the compromised accounts, it's not that I mean, right? so most of the, of the compromises do go for uh, uh, accounts, uh, regular accounts, or mean accounts. Enterprises, 
Dar în termen de scoară, nu mai target să se arăte la renovat firewall-ul, ai de ieși de pe mijloace, faină, exploit-ul, ai de ieși de pe mijloace, 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 ai de ieși to call them uh, nicely, just click on it, open it, and there you go. There is a strong resistance to change any kind, any kind of infrastructure. So next time when we read that it broke into whatever server, keep that in mind as well. That those guys that you make fun of uh, may lose their their jobs simply because whatever enterprise application is no longer working. So this is a really human natural mindset. Before before changing, they really want to, to, to test their guys. Sometimes they are uh, we see that this is quite a long, uh, long time because 99.9 that's quite a lot of uh, exploits are uh, uh, vulnerable that are exploited years after publishing. And even the higher profile uh, attacks that saw you pass them. Uh, Mentioned in the first presentation, I started to think did use some uh, uh, well known exploits. This is another uh, issue that is part of the security defense, the mindset. It's also the detection deficit. Why? Because currently, cybersecurity favors offense. This is the, the pure truth. And uh, again, looking from the defender uh, side, we do also have a service for pen testing, and we know what it means. But I do believe, and I would like to take this seriously, that the most challenging part in security is actually the defense part. Because it's a quite, quite light uh, uh, to crack a uh, uh, subject, quite tough to crack a uh, subject. And looking at the horizon uh, data breach uh, report throughout the years, we see uh, that the gap is still there. It's still there, no matter how uh, well the technologies have evolved. Uh, and that tells us that uh, we're losing actually this reason we need a different approach. And most of the time, the right approach is And there are, of course, I saw recently several events talks about offensive defense, some a little bit uh, similar. This is a response to this kind of. Uh, uh, asymmetry. When you realize that no matter what you do, the attacker has to be only lucky once and get in and you have to really win all the time, you somehow feel like you should uh, react. You should try to react. Uh, this is one piece of the puzzle because you cannot base your entire defense uh, on the uh, back, of course. Uh, moreover, when we look at the actors that do try to hack in it. They may be from the uh, scripting list, uh, and I still call them like that. And, uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of, of them that simply try to associate with them because it's a. Uh, and those of you who are in this field for some time, you do know the feeling of power again when you managed to, to hack into a system that was that was stuck. And this is, these are all the enthusiasts, let's call them maybe this way. I just get in, I see, see them by the way, quite a lot of residents for asking really, really simple questions than this way. But the, the higher end are some professionals that make a living out of that. Maybe they want the gray side or even on the dark side, uh, make quite a lot of money. And they are part of the, what we call the uh, cyber crime ecosystem. And this ecosystem will grow, it's still, it's still growing 
simply because law enforcement agencies simply cannot cooperate. The collaboration with them is very hard. One prosecution may take several years. Uh, the competencies are not really there. So it's like an ecosystem where uh, microbes and viruses simply flourish. And there is also the high end, the nation states that already expanded uh, their military thinking, their cyber thinking in this area. And we have do have quite a, a, a tough time explaining to companies that they should be concerned as well. Why? Because they can be one step, one jump point uh, to a next target for such a campaign, regardless that they are a milk factory or an uh, extraction company or whatever, retail company. You may be on, on the track for a, a higher profile target, a supplier of a certain company, like if you recall uh, Target and their uh, HVAC uh, system uh, supplier. So, why this is, uh, it, this is relevant? Because what we call for is, is a change of mindset. The defenders need to think differently. If in the eight, long ages uh, ago, 500 BC, the military thinking was that if you really want uh, good defense, you have to make, uh, I don't know, uh, if you want to win a war, you have to make a strong defense if you are in a, in a symmetric position. That may be changed a little bit uh, in the uh, later years when um, military uh, scholars uh, uh, come to closer with this. Recognize that defense and uh, attack are asymmetric. He, he calls, calls them uh, uh, non polar. There is no non polarity. What does it mean is that defense is not trying to win against the attacker. Polarity is that you have on one side uh, battles with the other side, and each of them tries to win against the, the, uh, the other. Whereas in security defense, you're not trying to win against the attackers. Right? What, you, what you try to obtain is at least to discourage this, this attacker for, for your adversary, for your target, and just move along. And by the way, when we call uh, APTs, we call them persistent because those attackers will get back and get back and get back and try to get their target in the middle of the statue presence. This kind of persistence is like if you recall the the scene from Matrix when the, uh, uh, when the Sentinels broke into Zion. It's exactly that feeling, that they keep, keep coming and coming and coming. So uh, you still uh, have absolutely no other solution but to keep firing at them. In defense, though, in security defense, in cyber, there are ways to make it so expensive for the attacker to try to move to, to other targets. Uh, and uh, moreover, when we talk about nation states, we have to understand that, by the way, there is uh, uh, quite a, uh, a difficulty for uh, uh, larger organizations, military or state organizations, to recognize where to, uh, um, where to see where to, how to, uh, to address cyber attacks and cyber espionage campaigns in the legal framework that uh, is already. In place. And uh, uh, we have uh, things like uh, the not really a war approach, uh, and uh, this is a concept already embraced by the uh, Russian army and one of their uh, uh, military thinkers in, in, in between the wars, uh, uh, wrote an obscure paper that uh, later on was adopted by, uh, by them into a Modern military thinking, which is a hybrid word, if you heard this word, this expression, uh, which means basically that we no longer fight with conventional forces. Because if you are there with, uh, with your presence, with your intelligence, and achieve your goals, you don't have to actually declare. So he was saying something like the, the war generally is not declared. We just uh, notice that our forces are there or our job objectives are uh, attached to them. And th this is quite a difficulty because NATO uh, is hard to define what, uh, what means engagement. There is a talent manual that is not fully uh, assumed by, by nations 
And by the way, this is you know, for the definition there of a cyber attack by uh, NATO action to disrupt, deny, degrade, or destroy. So, by the way, disruption is also an attack. And the, the really, really, really big challenge is when we put the Article 5 of the Alliance, if, I don't know, nation state uh, infrastructure is disrupted by an adversary. And how do you react? We send the fighter jets to the home uh, data center, and whatever, father in a suburb where the attacker is, the attacker is originally, it's, it's quite a challenge. But getting back to my, my point is that in this field, in this cyberspace, where this, where this kind of, of uh, attacks and conflicts happen, all of our companies and infrastructure are potential victims, and we should be concerned with, with defense as well. Now, let's look at some uh, structural approaches for, for defense. Because when we talk about uh, attack, there, is, there are tens of thousands of tools frameworks uh, uh, and uh, uh, papers and materials to really sharpen our, our, uh, our swords. But when we talk about defense, one of the approaches is, uh, you may have heard this at uh, other security uh, events, it's called the kill chain. Basically what it means, it means that we already recognize that sooner or later an incident will happen in the economy. We'll have a breach. Some of will, will get in, but that's not the point to stop them to get in. The point is to stop them to achieve their objective. And the, uh, the modern thinking is in terms of adversaries that try to reach some objectives, getting into some data, getting into some infrastructure in the economic. So if we, if we understand the stages of such an attack, we manage to stop them in the stages of the attack. We, as the security defenders, did our job. So this is on sure. Moreover, to get there, what we have to start with is threat modeling. To really understand what we have to defend, to get them into categories of, of threats, and then map them to security controls. And if you are in consulting and do pen testing, please make a step further and do also implement real world non bullshit implementation of 2701 because there are some very good security controls that if they are really implemented really tough on their security defenses. Do not just propose a report, okay you have this and this and this problem we found your security is I don't know full of holes uh, uh, you're toasted. If you really are a security professional you do have to understand how to address the security problem if they found and help the companies tackle their defenses as well. So this is one, one such approach, we call it uh, intelligence-driven uh, defense because it's based on integrating all the information in the security lifecycle. And the starting point is uh, a threat modeling. The threat modeling then starts from the assets that we can protect, uh, the, their vulnerabilities, the, uh, decomposing them into uh, Composing parts, and there is uh, such a methodology proposed by Block Martin called Ideal Act uh, from identifying fine assets, uh, describing them, uh, decomposing the system, and uh, then implementing, applying the, the assessment between the, uh, the uh, triage and the security controls. So, although the, the risk seems already lost, there are very sound methods uh, and uh, um, Structured solutions to implement sound security. Moreover, after you do threat modeling, that means you understand your exposure, you have to do also attack. And attack modeling starts with who are the adversary, who would want to get in. If you are in a university, most probably some clever folks from uh, the usual audience will try to hack the I don't know, university network to show how smart they are. But if you are a, an energy company, you will not have most probably this kind of guy but you have different adversaries. And you understand the potential uh, attackers and their motives, you do threat modeling, you attack modeling, and try to cover the most probable uh, scenarios. And there are even quantitative methods for, for that. 
And lastly, all these steps have to be implemented as a process. And there is a capability maturity model developed for services. It can be very well applied in the security field as well, from planning to building security, monitoring, detection, and then the uh, server. So this is, let's say, a more theoretical part. Let's talk about a little bit the implementation part. So in, in the implementation part, the defense best practices are simply following uh, best practices for the games. This is our response. And by the way, there are quite well uh, documented uh, critical security controls at the Science Institute website that can be directly uh, implemented by any uh, security defender. And of course, there are some, some other uh, uh, best practices, like notably implementing the monitoring uh, solution in the networks. Why? Because it's like flying without the radar. If you don't have the monitoring uh, solution in the network, you, you don't know when you are attacked, what happened. You cannot just uh, hunt around on, on your computers. Moreover, this is a slide I added after uh, this morning presentation about SCADA networks. Actually, there are solutions for scaling. There are quite good solutions for scaling networks, even though these networks are uh, comprising mostly of, of uh, legacy, uh, legacy equipment. Some of them lack even a simple uh, username and password authentication. Not to mention, I don't know, cryptography or second factor, whatever. But there are solutions for securing these kind of networks as well. You just have to be interested in the uh, defense. And when we talk about defense, as I said, monitoring is a key part of that. And all the processes may take years to mature. And one key point in a security operations center before, after monitoring is the incident response part. This is where uh, I wanted to get it. Why? Because these specialists have to figure out. Uh, the, the relevant information from uh, uh, noise of other sort of things happening in the network and try to find the, the intruders and the compromise system in the shortest time possible. But also answer quite tough questions like how bad it is? Did they exfiltrate the kind of data? Is there a financial impact on our company? So making uh, uh, Making sense of all the information you collect is called generally uh, threat uh, intelligence or intelligence driven defense. I will not go into details of all the components. My point with this uh, uh, slide is to show that you have to really integrate all the sources and make use of uh, uh, sound uh, um, security solutions to derive information that can help you uh, build your defense. When we talk about threat intelligence, you will see quite a lot of, of uh, terminology, and I will not go to it. But this is something that you will have to deal with daily. The sources of information about the text are in various formats, and most of the time you will be expected to react to react the, the one that was embraced as a simpler format by the industry is the Open IOC. And the methodology proposed by, by Mandiant is also quite common sense. You find the first link, you investigate that, you look further, and you, and you keep digging until uh, you have a full view of, uh, of the overall picture. And uh, this is just some information. The more advanced one from uh, from, Mitchell, from the previous slide is to also capture the context, the potential type of the potential campaigns. So if you if you look farther, you see that the, the, the red hole goes quite deep because all this universe of, of technologies uh, and uh, the complexity of, of defense is is quite challenging. So just to, to wrap up this part, my suggestion is anyone playing ball? One, two, three, four, okay. So <coughs> A metaphor I'm, I'm using uh, when we talk about defense is chess versus go. In chess, the key objective in the beginning is to uh, 
focus on the center to capture some, uh, some critical area. And when you deal with an uh, asymmetric adversary that is strong, uh, then you try to somehow obstruct that. This is the traditional defensive in depth. Well, from, from an attacker point of view, it's hitting uh, critical areas. Whereas the defender has to have a goal player thinking. In goal, uh, the strategy revolves around controlling the corners, not necessarily the center. And moreover, as a rule of the game, if you play with an asymmetric adversary that is stronger than by you do have some extra steps. And these extra steps would be in, in a security defense. To, uh, proper preparation, proper monitoring uh, for you to, to be able to, uh, able to react and not lose, not lose ground. So, uh, what is the critical function of incident response is time. If you have the right uh, system in place for monitoring, what you want is to catch them before they, they reach their objective. And to catch them before they reach the objective, you really need some uh, methodologies and tools internally uh, to be able to do that. And there is, for instance, a, a very good paper from Mitre uh, about building the best, best practices for security operation centers. Those, those of you who do work in such centers, uh, for those of you, I do recommend to take a look at it. And by the way, one of the recommendations is to have a dedicated hunting team that would look for those more advanced uh, cyber attacks. Why? Because those are very weak signals and very hard to, to capture. Now, uh, my proposition and my goal for this presentation was to give you a different perspective from the defender point of view. And to tell you that the incident response part is at least uh, the same one as the defender's point. And further one, uh, I will, I will pass the mic to, to my colleague uh, Cosby, who is incident response manager at SERSA and uh, UTI and is dealing with, with such uh, stuff, uh, to, to show you some of the uh, approaches to really win at uh, this game. So, Cosby? Thank you very much. So, like the other motion, we are hearing you. No, you use the other. So, that the other mention that the time pressure for incident responders is very, very huge in this field. And uh, for that, uh, I will introduce you the rapid response domain. And I will show you the rapid response. It's a very nice model developed by Google. It's an uh, open source. And uh, after that, I will show you a few things. So, for uh, memory analysis with uh, volatility. So, uh, here you have the, the memory for its advantages. Uh, actually, the, the memory is the best place for when you should, uh, when you must uh, find the most of the We will find the, the rootkits, binary obfuscations, and uh, so on. Practically, in memory, we have uh, all the context uh, at that moment uh, uh, that, uh, that system. Uh, actually, it's the most important part of the, of the life incident response to, to collect, to dump the memory, and to analyze it. First of all, we, should, we must uh, look for uh, identifier process or suspect process. Uh, I will show you in the, in the demo. Uh, memory come from a system which was affected with uh, dark comment, and then we have a process, a malicious process, which is very easy to find it. But uh, not in all the situation of uh, the malware, which is uh, so obvious. The analysis process, the analysis, and the is another mission for you. If you have network artifacts, look for manipulation, uh, search for things, and uh, dump the process in order to, to send box analysis or I don't know, to run an uh, uh, anti machine. Like I said, uh, we, I will show you the volatility. 
I don't know if you heard about it. It's a very powerful tool for, uh, for doing memory analysis. It uh, has a lot of plugs, and uh, there are some of, uh, some of them. And uh, now I will move to the practical part and I will show you some things with volatility and the uh, general. Sorry, one moment, please. No, it's okay. Um, so, actually, uh, just uh, two components. The server component, which is uh, the console, with the flow collector, and uh, the, the main component is launch uh, the activity on the target machines. The agent, and then uh, Gerard has a, a light agent which must be deployed to the infrastructure. Well, why I think it's, uh, it's very powerful, Gerard? Because uh, uh, I see uh, scenarios uh, where Gerard was developed was deployed in infrastructure with more, more than uh, 10 to 200 k system. It supports Windows, Linux, and also Mac. So, Gerard uh, has uh, two main concepts implemented in, uh, in this. First of, first of all, it is uh, artifact manager. Uh, artifact uh, is the, the things for, for the, what are you looking for in the system. Uh, for example, for the type of APT, I define some, uh, some type of artifacts and uh, I run it on a system that. On the other hand, Gerard uh, and the flows, and uh, those are the actions uh, which allow you to, to collect information in the uh, system. And there are the uh, types of, uh, of uh, flows. We can run the flows to analyze the memory. We generate uh, the report. Also, we can start the memory from the system if you want. So what I want to mention is that uh, you can launch the flows from one uh, time. If you want to collect information from one infrastructure, uh, you must uh, launch your uh, hands. Also, we can collect the uh, network artifacts, file types, file system. And the, uh, the artifact that you define in the artifact manager. So, I'm uh, also very to browse to Jerry uh, to, to browse the virtual file system. You can see the registry jobs, OS partition, and the down the system. Okay. Task manager uh, looks like uh, close to uh, the more differences that you can launch the uh, uh, system in your infrastructure. I move now to, to the volatility. Like I have uh, a memory dump which was from a system which was affected in that comic. And I will show you some steps in order to identify the error process in that file. Maybe just a clarification to understand the, the transition to GRR. So I was saying, best practices uh, dictate to implement a monitoring system. That monitoring system will raise some alarms. That means you have some dates that something is wrong with some systems in your network. What do you do next? Do you just connect there or, and try to uh, fool around with some processes, run some tools? The, for rapid response, what you can use is such a tool, uh, like a good uh, rapid response, and get very fast some, some answer while it's going. Moreover, you can get the, the memory image and analyze the information. 
So what you can do on a machine? Okay, so first of all, uh, uh, when you get the Uh, so, uh, uh, first of all, when you get an image from a high, you should uh, must uh, uh, finger print on that image. And uh, plugging an uh, image from a plug is a pass in this way. Uh, it takes a few seconds, and after that, you see that the machine was. Uh, because seven satisfied one and the time I don't know I will stop it because we don't have so much time. And after that we know that the profile of that machine was And after that, we will launch And after that, we will launch the PSX view planning, which will be asked for the data results from the network of sources of the process. You need to wait, to wait a few moments. Okay. Here, we have the process for, uh, for that moment. Uh, and that process, I think, is, uh, is malicious because the attacker is a misspelling of the LDM talking to the person. And then. Uh, and, and, uh, the direct links for that process for normal process is like T and F. After that, I will want to, to show uh, to see uh, what is the uh, from uh, the path for where the, the, that process was launched. And we have the process I gave you. Okay. We like that we have this plugin. We like it. Yeah. That, that was the first indicator that uh, we have our own process. The second one is the path from where the, the process is running. Uh, it is running from a uh, which is a common uh, path for a uh, pilot. And also, we can match a PS3 plugin, and we will see that. We see that uh, that, uh, that process has a check, not that uh, not that uh, not exit. This is not a, a normal situation for for not that. And uh, also, this is a, a malicious process. And we can check this with uh, by using the uh, So, we find here a mutex, which is specific to dark comet, and uh, some functions. Terminate process, this is not a normal resource for not activity. So, this is uh, what uh, we can uh, do with all of uh, these indicators. We can create uh, IRCs in order to, to run. Uh, to, to do nothing in, uh, in our network and find all the systems that was uh, affected with For that, we can use 
Mangan Open IOC editor is free. And it's very, very easy to, to, to use. Here I have a, 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 a no by an IOC editor course, but you can find it only by adding some items. So you are going to process that you can process it and uh, yes. and another uh, is uh, another uh, indicator that you should find in the project. We have a open eyes. With this open eyes, you can uh, use the uh, deadline, which is also one of our tools, and uh, just uh, Okay, I think it's, uh, it's enough for uh, this uh, part. And uh, if you have some questions. Have uh, any confirmation of the integration of the uh, No, of course, it, uh, it doesn't have. Uh, maybe you are uh, referring to the integration of the CM solution or something like that? Uh, no, ask me. Uh, what kind of automation? You can launch flows in the right information from the systems. And the schedule of that. Yeah, you, you, you can see the task. It was not like the direct effects. Yeah, the direct effects are the movement where you define what, uh, what are you looking for in the system. And you can schedule after that uh, a flow or a month and collect. All the, all the information which is in the point. Uh, the impact on the uh, the agent is very is uh, uh, not consumed very much uh, as soon as it is done. The future resources. I, I have uh, I, I did some testing uh, the impact. I don't think we should. see any As a practical scenario, if you have some of the best conditions in your network, you pay the Yes. And uh, it's some kind of silent after the price will go anywhere. But it's not so aggressive, so it doesn't have a very strong signal. Uh, you find it, it has, let's say, one or two variants. And maybe some of the machines are uh, down, and then it goes up again, down. Yeah, uh, the region manage all the flows that uh, was received from the console. And uh, because the information after uh, you can collect a uh, uh, package of information or are sent, uh, are not, not all of the information are sent back to the machine or in uh, one point of time. The information is split in uh, more, more packages than are sent uh, back in the real symbol. So it's really hard to miss. Uh, Yes, yeah. one or two servers that uh, might. Uh, if I understand right, what you're saying is that you have a, an activity in a network that's a malicious activity, probably yeah. it's, uh, doing some other movements, and some of the servers at some point are offline. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is just the basic architecture, but if you have an agent, so the point of GRI is to run the agents on the machines. Monitor your entire architecture, you'll have the agent there. As soon as the machine is up, it will start transmitting what it has to transmit. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, if, if you are interested, I depend on the process of the 
projects. There is also, this is a course of course, there is a commercial uh, solution in some cases, in case of security, that one is in as a kernel service. But kernel service level is a really good really thing, and it can do some blocking as well, it can do some, it can trigger some automatic actions. The general at the point is either you have basically two scenarios in the two cases. Either you have you're actively hunting for something, you know you have some dates and you're looking for some things, or you are uh, doing some preventive actions. Let's look for instance at uh, all shop uh, instances. Should they be there? Uh, let's look at uh, uh, Internet Explorer that uh, have a child processes other than Internet Explorer. Why is that? Or even more than that, we have PowerShell that uses uh, encoding based 60. This is most likely a sign of automation activity because no administrator is trying to execute this specific for uh, some <laughs> encoded uh, shell code, right? Unless he's looking from the other one. Uh, so there are some some uh, some indicators that you can actively hunt in a letter with flows, like uh, Cosmin said. You can check for some uh, some flows to be run by plants, and I don't know, depends on how far you do it. And if the machine is not online, it will report when the other one gets back to the this uh, uh, the tools that you use. Uh, this is the application that you use. Day by day, I think you know, you're uh, in my demo, yes, Google runs this book and the four buttons. Uh, knowledge to do this or yes. Google uh, actually is in this this project. Uh, four people are paid by Google for develop the, the the tool. And uh, also the documentation is uh, it's okay. You can read uh, how to develop the uh, how to write an artifact, how to to define a flow and so on. So like custom stuff. Yeah, custom stuff. You can do custom stuff. It's not because it is a normal source project, it is very flexible and you can and extend the functionalities. Can you share some key levels that achieve the clients while doing this? I think no. It's on levels. No, but I recommend you to do it. It's really based on the service category. For instance, for consulting services, we cannot guarantee we invest in a lot of money to send the clients. For many security services, it's time to response at uh, time. There are some, for instance, some limitations based on security solution. If you do manage security, which is managing your antivirus installation network, you'll we'll have to base the SLA on the actual security. One thing is to have a vast, one thing, a different thing is to have a standard of security center. So, uh, those uh, those levels, uh, th these are actually based on some uh, several level objectives that are coming from the customer. So, if you write a file on the why is it on several level objectives? You can tailor the this. Otherwise, but there is just uh, some few generic terms like trying to respond, which is of course calculated by the time uh, uh, the action is on our side. Uh, so for our analysis, I can uh, have necessarily that we will find for sure exactly the Chinese group that is starting in China. So it's just uh, based on some of All right, I don't know how we are with the time. Okay, I get the sign like this. That means stable, normally. <coughs> Thank you, guys.
So it's a pretty really new project. Uh, um, we are doing this project today is because we want to find out more ways to improve it. We want feedback from you. We are going to invite you to our GitHub repository and to your thoughts, uh, your opinions, and ideas on how can this project uh, evolve. Um, first of all, my name is Rezman. I am a security quality engineer at the Digital Open Source Technology Center in Bucharest. And I am going to present together with my colleague Stefania. She is also in uh, the same team with me. Uh, she actually developed this, uh, this project. Um, a short agenda for today. Let's see something about our motivation, why we have done this. Uh, we have also analyzed some existing solutions. We um, have seen their drawbacks and we try to um, come up with a better solution. And also, of course, we are going to present our project, our uh, module. In the end, we uh, have a very nice uh, So, our module. Well, uh, who needs security? I think most of us. Well, uh, this is the first motivation. Uh, a lot of people are using, of course, uh, mobile devices. And a lot of them are running a big operating system. And this operating system uh, has a lot of uh, communication inside. I mean, Applications can communicate to other applications through different methods. And one of the methods is called interprocess communication, IPC, IPC calls. In Android, they are called intents. And if those intents are not securely enough, you may be a target. Well, our group um, is going to test um, this. IPC mechanism. Uh, how does applications know how to handle actually invalid impacts, invalid IPC calls? Basically, this is how an Android intent looks like in uh, code, in the source code. And uh, down here we can see, uh, so to say, a flow of a classic. Um, shortly, what does Fizing mean? Well, if you have a system which accepts an input, um, Fizing means, okay, let's throw some unexpected input to, to that gate, so to say, to, to that uh, interface. Let's scramble some data a little bit and uh, message that gate how to handle this. If it knows how to fail properly or not. Um, okay, uh, I told you that we have analyzed some um, existing solutions at that moment when we started our own uh, solution. And uh, there was a, a module called an Intent Fuzzer. Um, this module was implemented for Drawser. Um, I will come back later to what Drawser is. It's basically, it's another great framework for testing purposes, it's very good. And uh, it's uh, depicted in two main areas, so to say. The first uh, phase is called the data generation phase. The second one is called the run phase. And we found this uh, intent fuzzer module a little bit too complex. Why is that? Because it has a lot of dependencies. And uh, for example, a Python script which has to populate, to populate an APK and then uh, another Java code has to populate this database with intents and this is only the first phase, the generation phase. The second, you need, of course, the browser model and uh, another APK which has to mutate those intents and send it to the system. Nevertheless, um, that project 
has some hard coding to switch in there. I mean, you can test only uh, one kind of intent, which is a broadcast intent, and only for one kind of application. Okay, um, Drawser. Drawser is, uh, as I said, a testing framework for Android. Uh, it has two main parts, a Drawser server is installed on your Linux box, and uh, an agent, an agent which looks like this on the left side. Uh, this agent you are going to install it on your testing device, on your phone or your tablet, running Android of course, and it communicates through port 31415 through TCP port with the server. So you have to forward your ADB connection through that port and then you will communicate between your agent and your server. And uh, if you're going to see the browser um, GitHub project, because it's open source, it's a developed by WR for security. Uh, you can see that uh, how can you contribute to this project. If you want to develop a module, which is what we have done, uh, you have to specify a lot of parameters to this uh, module, and then you have to release it under three clause PSD license. Um, and then you will actually pull a, uh, pull a trigger a pull request, sorry, to, to the developer team. And then uh, they will analyze this and say, okay, I accept it, and I will put your module in the next uh, version or not. Um, this is how the class looks like. You see here um, is the name, the description, the license, and uh, here are the parameters which you may pass to our model. Uh, all the source code is on GitHub, and uh, now we are going to uh, request uh, to the MWR info security team to assess our code, to, to check it. Um, for a short uh, picture, how does our module look like? Well, of course we have the ruler agent on the testing device, and uh, here is our module, it's called Fuzzy Loser. Uh, it collects information regarding all the, the activities running on, on the device, or only on one single package you want to test. And uh, it depicts all uh, intent filters you have on that application, and based on that intent filters, uh, it generates five intents. Um, then, afterwards, as output, we have different types of output. We have seed files. Those seed files are basically a uh, run trace until something crashed. So, if you want to retest, if your application has been fixed, you simply uh, take that zip file and you run it to uh, your system. Sorry. And also we have some logs which may be analyzed for further issues. Um, we can send uh, different types of intents, either broadcast intents or fast intents. And uh, you are not going to see in this picture, but we have also developed <coughs> a very short model for the nano series attack against the activity manager. <coughs> so, uh, here are the kind of parameters you can uh, send to, to our module and their dependencies. For example, you will simply run our intents.fat module. Having those kind of parameters, broadcast intent, fuzzy intent, complete test, test, or template. And if you are uh, choosing one of those options, you are obliged to pick either for a package name or to test all the packages inside the phone, for example. 
and the zone of the course we have the logs. Those logs are pointers and they become C points if something crashes. Of course, you can uh, read this by using a specific C file, as I said, or you can try to run an analysis service attack against the activity manager. <coughs> Those are some uh, examples you will see during uh, the demo. Um, here is the, the project console. You issue the client, as I said, running the browser and passing those parameters. Or you can assess these uh, commands, you can issue these commands directly from, uh, from the Linux shell by calling browser console connect minus C and the command you want to pass. <coughs> Here is a picture of some um, kind of results, so to say. Um, it seems like uh, it's a little bit linear. For example, if you are going to run like uh, 200 and something intents, it will take like 2.5 minutes. And if you are going to run like 3,500 intents, it will take like 30 minutes. <coughs> if uh, you are going to start, for example, a very big session, Using all the parameters you can possibly fuzz uh, for an intent. Uh, when we take like this, for example, for my single package like GMS. <coughs> uh, testing our module, we have found uh, different kinds of exceptions. Unfortunately for us, it didn't break anything in the native code, but only at application level, so to say. So we have seen just some Java exceptions. The most frequent one is the Java non-voter exception. And uh, I know we like minions because uh, we have one here. So before the demo, uh, here is our GitHub, where you can find our projects. <coughs> we have multiple uh, open source projects on, uh, on this GitHub. We have one related to Media Fuzzy Framework also, which uh, was one very good tool for uh, finding out some space fright bugs, developed also by my colleague and uh, another interfacing uh, framework for Android. Next, uh, my colleague will show you some kind of demo of our project. It will be run on a Nexus device, running Android 5.1.1. And uh, if you have any questions, Mark. Yes. <laughs> Cases. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with this yet. 
depends on the application, but most applications um, are not running the uh, same for in that uh, service. Okay. And uh, two, other one, two other questions. Uh, I mean, is there some sort of, you mentioned computation, is there some, is there some sort of percentage of attacks or exploit vulnerabilities that are based on index that justify your work? I mean, is there some sort of statistics on this? Because it didn't uh, say the same thing that. Yes, um, we have read some interesting articles, and uh, some guys, for example, um, have discovered some exploits, but their intents, their crafted intents against different uh, applications, has crashed in the end of C code, and uh, it led to some CVs also. They have run some attacks against the Facebook application, eBay application, and so on. Using it as? Using it, correct. And uh, the other, so, sorry, just this is the last one. Uh, what, are you, what are you using for a parameter, for example, for strings, for numbers, for IP addresses? Do you have some sort of ranges, scope? You have, let's say, let's say a parameter is in here, right? Yes. You, you use a certain range, you have full cover of the entire 32 bit the integer range, or for strings, for example, or anything like that. You have specific goals, which is what you fast. Uh, for the moment, not. Uh, we are generating some random strings having random characters and random nets. So, nothing very. Not, not, not yet. It's, it's pretty young, this kind of model. So, thank you. Okay. Can you see anything? Just, just uh, like the background. Okay. <coughs> Any preferences, I guess. Okay, thank you. Profile is the profile. Colors? Yeah. Okay, uh, we are going to showcase uh, you the Drawser framework and uh, Drawser comes also with a password manager application is vulnerable from many aspects. Um, I think it's not very really too much. Actually, it requires you a password, a main password, and uh, then you will be able to store your accounts. Inside, um, we are going to set up this uh, application. So it asks you for a password for a pin, and then uh, it uh, receives data like uh, your Google account, for example, and then for your Yahoo account. Yeah, I don't know.
it, it is not about this part. Uh, you will see some interesting facts on the white um, screen. Um, we have started browser. This is how it looks like. Um, you have to enable it, and then you have to port forward uh, DB. And then uh, you simply connect to, to the browser. <coughs> okay, uh, this is the browser console. Okay. Hello, my name is Pania, and I will present the rest of the presentation. So, we have in the right side of the Android device, and on the left side, we have the browser console. I will start by showing you how to use browser with some single commands. For example, if you want to show to see all the modules that the browser provides you, you can simply run the list command. You can also see our module here, intensifies browser. <coughs> okay. Um, for example, if you want to see all the packages installed on your device, And these are all the packages installed on your device. You can see that in this. Next, if you want to see more information about the package or their vulnerabilities, you run this command. And uh, see, for example, for the Siv application that that's one talked about, we have three activities exported, and more important, there are two content providers exported. The content providers are related to the database on the SIEV application. For example, the SIEV contains the database as a table with the passwords and the keys we said before. So let's try to access the content providers. To see information about the content provider, You run this command, and we see that uh, the content provider have, has the right permission. So this means that we can access it. Let's see if this is right. We will try this by creating some queries, some SQL queries. In order to run an SQL query, we first need their content units, URLs. And we see that there are three URLs keys. Sensors. These are the most important. So let's try to access. Here we run a query with I provide a query with module. <coughs> and we can see that these are the password that we set, but they are closed in Web64. With those are functionalities, we can also encrypt, decrypt a password. Like this, and we have to give the string. And we can see that the after pass that we said before, we have decrypted it. The same happens for the, the other card. Okay, enough about the browser, let's go to our module. If you want to learn about the module, how to run it, what are the parameters, you run the module with a help command. And we can see, I see, did, there are the parameters that one talk about. More important, more important options, like we said, are broadcast limited, fast limited, Run a zip file and a DOS text. I'll show you about all of them. Okay, first let's create the fuzzing agent, which was the package from that Android that phone, because we found out it has some vulnerabilities. This is 
are the command type. I gave the parameter select fast parameters so that we can choose the parameter that we want to fast. In this example, action and flag. That's running. There are 33 inlets corresponding to the 33 components in, the, in that package. And we can see that the action flag, the action parameter is fast, just as the flag is. Okay. Now let's try with the broadcast agent with the same.
Okay, it's ten minutes. Um, is this framework expandable to other platforms, or do you plan it just for Android? So, do you have plan to expand it for your mobile device? So, actually, it has an Android budget for the moment. So, I don't know if you are. I, I don't know. The, they have released only for Android. Um, you have to install this agent uh, on the testing device, so you have to submit it to that agent, to that particular agent. Thank you.
capacity effective. Uh, and uh, the attackers were, were, were able to kind of uh, have access to all sorts of services in various devices. So this is pretty great stuff. I mean, we are talking about people that are using devices have a certain degree of trust in them, but they are, let's say, broken uh, through one way or the other. So what we are going to do is look into the IS uh, security mechanisms and try to do things better. What's happening in IS, there are a couple of security mechanisms on different levels. The first one is if you have coded in using Xnode or anything, you'll probably know about public and private frameworks. This is a, a separation of the API that allows a developer access to only a set of apps, those public APIs. The private API is inaccessible. And the private API, if accessible, would allow the attacker to do all sorts of nasty things. For example, sending out premium SMSs and wasting money for you, getting access, getting your uh, data, your address information out from your computer, that kind of stuff. So those are hidden. And the way Apple enhances the security, uh, the security mechanism, is through what they call Apple vetting process. Whenever an app is submitted to the App Store, it takes about two weeks if you, if you have done that for Apple to check the app and where we're not sure what it does, where we're assuming it does some sort of set analysis and sees whether there's something malicious inside the app. If not, it simply uh, lets it go. And that's what Jekyll, Jekyll, uh, the Jekyll apps did. They hid malicious behavior inside, uh, in, let's say, in a wrapper of the online looking app. And they were able to bypass the private public uh, framework API separation which is not that good because it's the same address space of the app. And through that, the app will be crossed. However, when you have an app there, and if you were able to pass those two obstacles, there are two more. One of them, you may, you may know about this if you are using the iOS, is privacy settings. Whenever, for example, you start WhatsApp, it says, do you want WhatsApp to access your location, your uh, address? That's privacy settings. It's a daemon that's configured to, act, to ask you uh, at the beginning, do you really want to do this? And if you want to do this, which most users certainly do, and they say users will choose uh, flying pigs over security every single time, then you have access to that, to that particular app. That's a layer of security that kind of allows the user to control what, uh, what he or she can give an app to access. And the other one, and this is not, uh, let's say, user-centric, it's mandatory, is sandboxing. What sandboxing does is every app has a very restricted set of operations it can do. However, as we'll see, that's not that restricted. So we are going to go into this sandboxing, which is actually based on an enhanced security layer. It's called Trusted BSD in IS. It, it, uh, this goes both for Nightmare 6 as well. So it's the entire, everything happens uh, there as well. Um, our goal here, this is a joint research uh, adventure we're having with uh, TU Darmstadt, uh, with the uh, Security Institute from their case, and with uh, uh, North Carolina State University, and we are working towards improving uh, IS security. And one of the keys, uh, one of the key uh, factors in this is understanding the sandbox, uh, the sandbox in the which is what I did. Uh, so we want to improve this, we want to know very good how it works and how we can improve. About it. So, uh, like, regarding Apple sandboxing, uh, you may know that there are various APIs for sandboxing. Uh, does anyone know about SecComp on Linux? Okay. So, SecComp is an API which mentions which, uh, what system calls is an app allowed to do or not. What, the, what Apple sandboxing does, it allows it to create a profile for an app and it, it, it's some sort of, it may do, it may be whitelisting, it may be black, blacklisting, it says what are you allowed to do in the application. Uh, this profile is described in a scheme like rule, we'll see uh, in, the, in a minute how it looks. It's called SDP or Sandbox Profile Language. So you can you get this sandbox, and then this sandbox describes what are the operations that the application needs to do. As I said, you can do both whitelisting and uh, blacklisting, whichever you, you see fit. Bad news, there's very little, if any, documentation on the matter. You can see about two pages on, uh, on the uh, on Apple site, and there's about a white paper, four pages long, but no more than this. So you, can, you, can, you have to go uh, into your site and, uh, and the like. 
There is also a container, it's called Container Sandbox Policy. It's a default sandbox policy for every third-party app. What app, whatever app you install on your phone, that app gets to use the Container Sandbox Policy. So if I'm installing WhatsApp, if I'm installing a brand new game, if I'm installing, I don't know, Snapchat, whatever, that application, being a third-party application, uses container. Which leads us to the question, leads us to the question what does container look like? What does it do? Is it secure enough? Is it tight enough? Is it really tight enough considering the fact that it, it is useful for uh, this, this large range of applications? And the, the answer is obviously no. So we want to kind of treat a, uh, a thinner, a more restrictive sandbox policy. But in, in order to do that, you know, we have to know perfectly how container works. So we have to reverse it. We want to see, okay, this is container. We have all this bunch of policies that are allowed, but only a subset of those are required for snapshot. Only a subset of those are required for a movie player. Only a subset of those are required for Safari. Okay, so can we can we shorten that? And we want to we want to reverse it. We want to have this container profile, we want to know how it looks like in order to uh, improve it. But as, as said, the challenges are very uh, are very high. There is no official documentation on how SDPL looks like. You can only check certain implementation. There's some files in the MacOSX file system. You have some .sd files which show you some of the aspects of your uh, of your sandboxing uh, frame. So actually, you don't know what you can use to create a sandbox policy file. You don't know. There's no documentation on that. You have to. You have. You just have to dig for it. The other one, you don't know how it works on the inside. What's the API? How does it call? How does the SBPL file get to a binary format? How, how, how does it get loaded? Anything. No documentation. Nothing. No source <laughs> code. Nothing. The other thing, when you come, well, this SBPL format gets compiled to a binary format. That's the one is used for, of course, performance reasons. You can't parse all the time of the whole file. You do a binary format of that and you use it. No documentation on that whatsoever. You don't know how it looks like. You have a you have a binary file as we'll see uh, in the in the in the next slide. What does it mean? You have to dig into that as well. Okay, so let's go from the beginning. This is what an SDPL file looks like. This is the beginning of the uh, when you want to create something for an app. It's it's a snippet of a of a file in the macOS X file system. Let's go through it a bit. What does this do? It allows an it, this is called an operation. IPC post X shared memory. It says, okay, this app is allowed to create IPC access using shared memory, but it also has to use this POSIX main. So if this is allowed, provided the argument is this. Mac lookup is kind of the equivalent of the intents as was being uh, spoke to earlier. They are, look, they are kind of uh, used for IPC communication, and it says, okay, you are allowed to kind of communicate with the network demand, network schemas, sharing demand, and again, this is packet pack filter demand. And some others as well. So you can have a law operation or a law operation with constraints. So only on this pack of attributes. That's how it looks like. And then in, in the end, you get the binary format. I, I don't have the laptop, but it's, it's binary. If you do a text not one, it, it just falls on the screen. You don't understand anything from that. Uh, okay, so how it works, you have these rules, is ritual is a deny, the kernel loads the, the profile, the binary format, and there are specific hooks inside the kernel, as you expected, that provide you allow or deny for certain operations. For example, if I have a deny for a, for a file read, I can't read in files. If I have a deny for a file read and the regular expression that mentions A star, I can't read any files that start with an A, because A, a, a plus, that's it. A regular expression for that. So that's how that's how the that's like a of how it works. Good news is that it's fairly similar on Mac OS X and iOS, and you can use Mac OS X developer, which is easier uh, than iOS. However, you, you still need an iOS device, jailbroken one actually, in order to do the actual development. You can't uh, get, get all that. Uh, the implementation of the sandbox, there's a kernel extension which is similar to a kernel module, which does this implementation, and you can uh, look for that even further. Okay, uh, there are certain functions which are part of this libsan, libsandbox.dy libsandbox.dy library. It's the shared library implementing the sandbox. 
Whenever you submit an SBTL format, there's a function which is called sandbox compile. This function is called and it translates the SBTL format into a binary format. And when we kind of do investigation inside the DIS kernel, we can get the container format in its binary form. So what we actually want to do, we want to have this binary format and do the reverse of that. So it's kind of, let's say, decompiling process. We call it reverse. So we want to decompile the binary format to its SBPL initial format, so that we know how, how it looks. What, are, what is the default, the container profile, used by every third-party app that is installed on your, on your system? Um, okay, so I, I talked a bit about this. Uh, those arguments, so for example, this global name, IPC POSIX name, these are called filters. So arguments, these are called filters. And these are called operations. So we have IPC POSIX SHM operation, MAC lookup operation, MAC for user lookup, system network network, uh, file read, file write, there's a bunch of them. And these ones, they are called filters. It's like arguments to system. This is how uh, this is how it uh, how it looks. And you have a lot of nice. So you have operation, a filter, and an action. A lot or deny. If you want, for example, to create a whitelisting approach, what do you do? You do a default deny. So by default you deny. If you know Cisco deny naming, something like that. And you just say allow rules. So I, I'm allowing this. If you want to build a blacklisting approach, you do a Default allow, you allow everything, and then simply state deny this, deny that, deny that. So you're allowing, you're allowing everything except for those. This is blacklist the approach. Okay, so what do we need to know? Well, first of all, as there is no documentation, we want to know what exactly can be stored in an MD file. What are the operations? What are the filters? All of them. How do they look like? Design document. Second, where can we extract the binary sandbox profiles? Those default profiles, for example, it's container, and there are many others. Where are they stored? How can we get them? Third one, what is the binary format? And another thing, we have to understand it. We have to kind of do a reverse engineering on it and see, okay, this is how it looks like. The first two bytes are this, the next four bytes are this. We have to understand it. And further, and the step we want to do, can we decompile it? Can we reverse it? How can we do it? So let's start. Most of this work has fortunately been done before in a certain degree. There's been excellent, absolutely excellent work done by Luis Plazakis, Dion. Uh, you can see his uh, GitHub repository, the XNU Sandbox, that's the source code that he wrote. Uh, he's the author of the fifth chapter in the Xhacker Sandbook. Uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, the Apple Sandbox. In 2011, we had a presentation of Black Hat regarding the Apple Sandbox. This is very good, very good documentation on his side. However, it was using IS5. And now IS9 being uh, in place, it's quite a difference. Starting from IS7, if I recall, there have been a number of security enhancements. One of them being the, the let's say, kind of a complete rewrite of the way the sandbox profile is written. So we had some ideas, but we had to start well, a bit from the beginning. However, another author of the IS Hacker Sandbox, Stefan Esser, had done uh, a reversing of the sandbox for ISA. This was in uh, October, if I recall, 2014, because it looks like 2014. So he had done that. But to a, to a, just to a given level, and then nothing further happened. So we, what I did actually was I took a lot of time, a couple of months actually, to, to go through, through all the documentation, do a step-by-step -step approach, get what, get what, where these guys were, and then we'll move forward. Uh, Stefan is still didn't write any emails, unfortunately, uh, but there was a guy, Ido Daizobi, who's the other author of this, who replied and gave me some pointers, but other than that, we were kind of on our own. But those were very good resources. Uh, if you go to this GitHub page for, uh, for Section Mines, the, the company where Stefan is working, um, it's, it's a very nice one, but however, the resources that are there have only been posted there in June, which was two months after I had started working on it. So by the moment he posted it, I already had uh, a bit of the, of the things I know unraveled. 
if if it, they were for the if they were for them from the beginning, it, it could have been a lot of help for me, but they weren't. Okay. So what did we do? Okay. So we want to uh, at the beginning uh, let's recap. We want to have this decompiled. We want to have the binary format, know how it works, and we want to retrieve the initial SDKL format. Uh, we want to have the list of operations and filters, all of them. We want to get to know how it works. We want to be able to extract the binary profiles and data among them. Uh, and we want to uh, do the reverse. Okay. How do we do that? Well, you have to do it the other way around. So you, it, it's, it's kind of a step-by-step -step approach. Try on that. What we did was we created SDPL format files and then we compiled them. And we did that with a lot of them. If, if I will show my laptop, there, there are hundreds of them that I created simply to see, does this work? Is this working properly? Can I compile that? How does this work in the end? So if this was the, the, the approach that I used. Um, I'll, and so there's also a PDF format that I won't, uh, I won't go into that because it, it's, it's a little deeper. What we did to find out those, the full list of, of filters and operations. Dion and Stefan have, li have listed most of them. For example, they listed all the operations. And they said, okay, this is how you found it. This is how you find it. I actually found a better way to do it. And all, uh, what they did, they kind of went deeper and did some IDA stuff, binary analysis, blah, 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 inside the sandbox KXT file. Fairly awesome, fairly difficult. I, what I did, I, I found out there's a bunch of strings inside the library, so uh, actually strings, RG, inside the library, which listed all the operations and all the, all the, all the filters. It wasn't exactly human-friendly, but I was, able, I was able to kind of grasp, grasp all of them. So, at the, at the end, I, have, I had all the filters and all the operations, so one, one step further. I don't have any, any, any samples, although we'll go over this. Um, okay, so we have this. We have the operations. Okay, let's now go to the binary stuff. Let's extract the binary data. This was a bit easier because it was documented. However, there are only two bullets on a slide by Stefanes. And he did mention to publish a very nice thing here, but as I said two months after I had started it and figured it out by myself. In another, in another way of doing it, but uh, it did work. So uh, there is in the sandbox D, there's a daemon which is used for logging sandbox information. You have all the binary, uh, the default binary profiles. They are there. You just have to know where to look. It's not that difficult. It's not that easy either. You do some offsetting and you know, okay, this is where it starts from, this is the plan. Uh, let's, dump, let's dump it and uh, check. Oh, so uh, at the end we have the we have the binary format and now we can look at it. So we have the binary format, we have all the operations. We have a start. <coughs> How does the binary format work actually? Well, this has been documented by Leon and Stefan, so it was rather easy. By rather easy, I need two or three weeks time support, so that's rather easy. Uh, so we were able to do it and we, we, we knew how it looks like. So how does it look like? There's a header, there's two bytes of header. And then you have an offset inside the file pointing out to a list of regular expressions. We have, we have a lot of regular expressions in the, inside this uh, sandbox profile. You want to say, I want all files that start with A. I want all files that end with B. That's part of the regular expression. Um, then you have a number of regular expressions. And most, most importantly, you have a table of offsets. We'll get to that in the third. Let's now go to the regular expressions. These, these were the, so there, these are the topics that I mostly invest, I guess, about one and a half, if not two months for each. This is what the initial file looks like, the SDPL format. This is what the part of it, that's kind of the corresponding side of the SDPL format, binary format. Do you see any resemblance? Well, there's some sort of ABCD over there, uh, but and the C and the T and the so in the in the in the literal in the literal side. Um, turns out, and this is rather interesting, but it was amazing for me to see. It. You have the regular expression, and what they do, they create a non-deterministic 
automata, if you know finite state automata, so you take the automata out of the regular expression and simply linearize it in binary form. Let me give you a look. If you don't hear, for example, let's go uh, uh, 0 to 0 to, can I see a, uh, okay, 0 to. 0 to means after that there's a character, 62. 62, that's a B. 0 to 63, that's a C. 0 to 64, that's a D. So you have some sort of, kind of, let's say, compiling of a regular expression inside the binary format. There are also other stuff. There's, there are jumpbacks. There's, for example, if you know the carrot sign for beginning of line, you have dollar sign for end of line. Those are only really there. And those sorts of jumps back forward are also encoded in the sentence profile in the binary format. Once you get to know them, which is a bit of work, you can then do it. You, you know how the, the automaton looks like, and you can get to work. Um, okay. And how do you do it? How do you do that? So actually, what I what I did while doing this, it was let's say half time reversing hexing. The other half half time was algorithms. So if you don't know algorithms, sorry. It it it, it, it was kind of a very complicated work. Uh, so what you do? I created actually the representation of the of the not the automata, and I placed it. I created the Python representation of that. And the other thing. Okay, you have the automata. How can you get the regular expression? And it's not trivial. Uh, and the way they say it, you use an algorithm that's called state removal that allows you to remove state by state out of, out of the, let's say, the graph of the, of the automata. And to just give you an idea how this works. Uh, <coughs> so you have three states. One state goes with A, and you get to the other state. This one gets B, and goes to the other state. There's also a direct, uh, direct uh, edge, which is called C. And from the second one, you get it from to the first one. What we do here is we remove this state. This is gone. <coughs> so to do that, from this state to get to the other state, you have two options. You go to C, and now because you remove that, you also have an A and a D. So you just create an A, B, edge to the second state. That's one. But you also have this one. So you have an A, but you have an E going back to this stuff. But then that you can repeat it. Okay, it's kind of low. So you do an A, B star and create that. And then you continue the process. And that's how you eventually construct the variable expression. It's been painful to do it. Uh, it wasn't smart for me to do it in Python because I didn't have pointers and, and some others, but finally I did. Okay, so I got the regular expression side uh, done. That was it. I guess the other, so that was solely for the regular expressions. Now let's get the idea that you have operations and filters. How does that look like? For each operation, we, you have what we call action node. So let's say, we have read start, you have to read everything. You can have allow, you have file write, you have a deny. Those need to be encoded. For each such operation, you have an action node inside the sender profile. It says, okay, if this is the operation, you do that. It is the operation to do this. So you have this, uh, these action nodes. For each of them, you have all those offsets to an action node. And there are two types of actions. This is very interesting, actually. One of them is, we call it terminal action nodes. The terminal action nodes are allowed or denied. You are either allowed to take that action or deny. What happens though if you have filters? For example, you can have either that, either this, either this, either this. What then is used is what we call a non-terminal node. We call it the decision node. That's what that Stefan Esther mentioned. So you say, is this match? If yes, great. If not, go to the other node. Is the other node match? Yes, great. If not, go to the other node. Is this match? Yes, great. If not, go to the other node. And so forth. 
So you have all those, let's say, non-terminal nodes that allow you to have filters, multiple filters, inside a given, a given operation. So you had to do that. For the terminal actually, it was very easy, you just have a lower tonight. For the non-terminal node, it was a bit more complex. Each terminal node had a filter. And you said, okay, I want this filter, for example, I want only to open the files that are using this name, global name, local name, path, whatever, those are filters. And if, if a match is found, create an offset to another action node. If, if a match is not found, to another, to another offset node, uh, to another action node. So just decide based on the match being found in a given field. And this was, again, not easy. You have to know the filters, and you have to kind of then uh, reverse them. And this is, I, I'm not sure how I would show this. Let me, let me just see if I can do it with the laptop, just a it's, it's rather uncomfortable because I don't have the mind that would be easier than. Uh, let, no, I'll, I'll just show you the, uh, the sound, that makes it easier. What we have above is the is the MPPL file. This is the binary. This is the initial format. And what you have below is kind of uh, just uh, a first wrapper of the compiler. So we just want to see okay, this is an action. This is a terminal an action. <laughs> what this says is okay. This is filter one, which is actually why we call a path. So it matches the path, and if it matches, it jumps to 2A. This is 2A. It is allowed. So the moment you uh, you you have uh, this filter, it jumps to A. It's okay. If not, it is denied. Okay. So once again, we get the filter. It says 2A, 2A, and it says allowed. If not 2-9, it is denied. So everything works. And then you go to the other, to the other side, 1F and the others. And there's some pretty interesting stuff here. For example, this one is another, is another filter. You have, zero, uh, you have 0, 4. It goes to 20. So if it matches, go here, 20. If it matches, get one. Once again, we have this one. It says if it matches this filter, you go to 20, which is this one. And here, if it matches this filter as well, then it is allowed. This is an AND. This is a required all. You have to have both available. So this is kind of this side here. You have to have both this filter and this filter available. And that's how it goes. Turns out, as in, as in the case of the regular expressions, you have to create another graph out of this. And you create another graph, with all the operations. Let's say, okay, you want this, you want that, this is the side, this is the other side. And after you create this graph, you have to linearize, you have to create the this mambo jumbo, as it looks like. Which is again not easy. I actually spent a, a lot of time thinking about kind of diagrams or kind of class key, if any of you guys know about them, how you can reduce algebraic expressions. Because I need to create the initial format out of which this particular graph was part. What's funny is that if you move these lines around, you get another graph. Although it's actually the same, it's, it's the same, uh, the same functionality, but it's, but it's different from uh, from the representation. So this is what I require, for, which is kind of an end, a logical end. Or require any is more logical or happens. And this is something I've done, I guess it was complete about 20th of September, something like that. If the, if the presentation were earlier, I wouldn't be able to show you guys this because I, I wouldn't have understood it by then. Okay. Uh, what's left? There's also a, a nasty thing which is called require not. So you have an end, you have an or, you have a not. So it says if it doesn't match this, then it's okay. I'll still have to go to the binary stuff and see how that works. Uh, there are also some default rules. For example, I have an action point, an action node, for each operation. If I have a single operation in my initial file, 
I still end up with about 100 action nodes. Some of those are default. I, need to, I, I don't need to use those, so I have to remove them from the reverse profile. So that would, uh, that's how about it. So what do you have at this point? We're, we're fairly close to, uh, to completing everything. Uh, we, need, we want to submit a paper some from the round 7th of November, if I recall, the top security conference, IGPSFP, and this will be a chapter in the paper. Yeah, I, I spent six months for a chapter. Yeah, so well, there are six chapters, so okay, about three years. But, but it's not me, so we're, we're a bunch of people working on that. Um, we want to make it more generic. At this point, it's rather, let's say, response friendly, non response friendly. Uh, and it's it's not that easy for someone from the outside to know how it works. Uh, there's a, there's a draw some many files, there are some speed, but you get to you have to know quite a bit uh, of the inner workings to make it work. Uh, so we want what we want to do, despite uh, let's say uh, after the research work, we're going to update it. We're going to make it more usable, and most likely we're going to publish this open source code, kind of the way Stefan and uh, Dion had done. Uh, and so that any, anyone uh, in the world can use it, you just clone it, have an, I don't know, a sandbox demon or something, have a hacker safe device, just run the script and you get the, you get the profiles out of that. And that would be, that would be. Uh, at this point, we have a draft, a, a draft form of the container sandbox profile. Uh, it's almost complete. We still have to be a, a, a little bit of nudging. We know if it works, if when we run an application inside of that, it doesn't crash. Because that, that, that we, we, we name, so it's, it's in its perfect form. We still have to see whether that that's uh, that would be okay, but we are very, very, very close to that. If my laptop would have worked, I would have showed how it, how it looks. It takes about 10 minutes to get it from a binary format to this format. It's a lot. It has about 2,000 action nodes. You create a graph, a huge graph out of that, and you have to zoom, zoom, zoom. I, just, I, I thought at the beginning it was doing this way, but then I just did the debugging and said, okay, it works a bit eventually. It takes 10 minutes. It's a huge file. And that's also something we need to think about. If, if it's that big and the body file default, it allows a lot of things, that's not good because that means that any app, if that app relies in the end on the sandbox profile and everything else, everything else is bypassed, it won't work. There are too many possible holes in the sandbox profile. So the idea would be, and that's, where, that's what we are kind of aiming for, to create a per app profile. We do static analysis, we do random analysis, we know what the perfect jacket is for the app, and we create a sandbox profile for that. That's the end goal. And we start from, container, from the container profile and, uh, and part of that. Some of the lessons learned, it's fine. It's a huge time consumption. So if 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 you if you don't have the time or the or the patience, I, I didn't have either, but I kind of learned that through. Uh, it's it's mind boggling at certain points in time. Uh, previous work was very helpful. So Dion and Stefan's uh, work probably got me three months of work. If Stefan had posted his source code on uh, GitHub earlier, probably an extra month that would have would have been, would have been saved. But we need to uh, what we could at this point. Um, I also found out that this is kind of now giving me feedback for the other teachers in UPB. Okay, guys, if you're teaching people graphs, give them some real world examples. If not, I can give them to you about the regular expressions of others. You have those, all those tasks in the academia, giving you graphs, to say, okay, you have A and B, and what are they useful for? Where they are? They really are. And uh, if you have to do reversing and you have to go to this stuff, be careful. You don't need to know only hex and operating systems, you need to know scheme, at what scheme. You need to do NFDs, uh, NFAs, regular expressions, functional programming, a lot of algorithms. So there was a bunch of stuff I had to dig my, my, uh, my hands in. It wasn't uh, just, you know, I know hex, I can decompile it, I can count this. No, it was a, uh, a full approach. Okay, so that would be it. Thank you. Uh, I know it's very technical. Uh, so if you have any question, I would be after I'm absolutely surprised. Yeah. How are you? What makes you certain that you catch all the right regular questions? 
Uh, I don't understand the question actually. We saw earlier some regular yeah. expressions mm -hmm. that it's in use. Yeah. How certain you are that those are the all the regular expressions that you use? All or old? Or old. old. Well, I can't because I do full coverage of the of the binary format. Everything is in the binary format. So what I do is actually I take byte by byte everything that's in the binary format. There's nothing left. So I do full coverage. Okay, so the register is the text of all the data. Yeah, so the, uh, the binary format, yeah, I, I, all the bytes inside the binary format are in a way or another fed back to the reverse uh, regular expression that they can't come up. Because sometimes the register is not such a good uh, kind of parsing. Uh, yes, yeah, but I'm not doing the parsing. I'm doing the, the, the inverse of that. So the guys in Apple, they made that the parsing. So they they brought a regular expression, they did automatically from that and binarize it, and then you did the reverse of it. Uh, um, one more question: What is your tempo? Uh, I just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the, the reversing. What, what can you do? No, that's not the end goal. That's not the end goal. The end goal, as I said is creating a type jacket for each app. So you have to get the sandbox profile, the container profile, which is default, and then you tailor it for a specific app such that you are only allowed access to the operations that you are really required. There is no need to give, for example, Snapchat access to, I don't know, Mm, there's a specific, I don't know, maybe location or some others, or I, I, I can give an example, but there are a lot of services out there or operations that you don't need for a given app to have access to. What do that mean? Can you create an SD file for using the first beginning of the SD file for the binary to, let's say, open a port within for a remote shell? I don't ask uh, I, I the question, sorry. Okay. Can you find the right method by using the reverse engineer in order to open a shell? Oh, create an equal application. Escape the sandbox. No, not sure. Okay, but then I have to create the thing that has an allow room for a search for a specific action. Yeah. Uh, so you want, for example, I'm not sure, so let's let me give you an example. There's, a, for example, a sandbox operation that's called sandbox Z. Yeah. Pro sorry, process Z. If you have an application, at a certain point in time, due to a trigger, exact being set in SH, it works. Okay. But you have to have that application of vulnerable or another application on the phone, yes. And if you have process exec enabled in the sentence profile, which if I recall by default is, then yes, you can do it. Okay, so using your the data from your research, I can then uh, understand it, how it works. And okay. <laughs> Create a new application. Okay, I, I, I'm guessing you can use it for that as well. Okay. I'm just going to tell you if you know how the sandbox profile, yeah, the, the, the default profile what is, and you can bypass all the other three layers of security, yes, then you can custom an app and kind of exploit, not exploit, bypass the rules in the single profile because you know it looks like that and that speed operation is all, yes. Yes, yeah. Or we can use, uh, let's say, a zero day exploit uh, mm -hmm. and then change the profile for the grid apps that suddenly become more. Yeah, well, yeah, of course. So you, 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 actually, it would be easier to dump it all together. So you just say De not, uh, allow any, default allow, and nothing else. So then everything else. So yeah, if you want, then you are able to kind of update the sandbox profile, the default profile, and use that there, yeah, so and then everything else. But that kind of similar to having good on a system. Then the system is totally compromised, you can't do anything with that, so it's, it's game over. Yeah? Uh, if the sandbox profile is not available, then you are not or not? Uh, they are complementary, actually. So, uh, they, they don't have any connection to each other. <laughs> Uh, what's, for example, it's like this. So you, let's assume you have a location D. It's called location D. Inside the default container profile, location D is accessible. 
because you need it. A lot of apps need that access to location. Some of them don't. But by default, the sandbox profile allows access to them. If you didn't have privacy settings on top of that, all apps would have access to location given. Sandboxing is just the first layer of defense. The others are, are, are on top of that. What we want to do, because the others are imperfect, and we, have, we actually have a CV reported that that's not a thing at the Apple. Uh, they, they're probably going to fix it in 903. Uh, because of that, uh, there are certain glitches happening in top levels that would be ideal to be fixed in the lower level. So that, that's what we are trying to do, create this tailored uh, sandbox such that any, I know, vulnerability or I know something missing in the top layer wouldn't uh, allow the app to get the, to the lower system. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you were able to see some expressions in binary, like A, B, C, D. Yeah. Uh, the question that came into my mind when I saw that in your presentation was why the hell did they try to use obscurity to prevent you from doing the exact thing you did? Um, because that, that, because of performance? No, but, but it's, uh, yeah, I guess it's so. I mean, why would you have security? They, they, aren't, they aren't concerned with the security. They aren't, they, they, and because, I mean, there are two approaches. Secret or open security. For example, if you have access to the source code, and by security. I don't think they are doing security by security. I think they are, they are simply using an approach. There is no documentation. Yeah, but they, 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 open but they don't care about that. They, 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 it's not so security. It's not their purpose to not document it. They don't need to do it. Why bother? Who's going to use them? That's the idea. Okay, so I'm, I, I don't think they are kind of evil intentions. Okay, let's hide everything. They are doing the binary format, make it performant. Do you need to show us to the others? Uh, we do we have that for that? No, no research. Okay, it's all about the money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense from company point of view. Obscuring it would be a lot of resources wasted, both from the CPU perspective when you load it into the center profile, and from the developer that has to do that. Nasty stuff, you know. Okay, thank you very much.
Sunt în ce s Hello? Thank you for staying this late. Uh, I was afraid I had one to stay to my presentation, so I have my wife. <laughs> She's in the audience. I think nobody would be here. <laughs> Thank you. So, I'm going to make a lot of friends today because I'm going to speak uh, about what everyone else is afraid to speak of. How we can catch up with today's malicious actors and what are our current security posture and what our future actions might be. Okay. First of all, uh, these are only my opinions, not those of my employers. My current or my former employers have the responsibility for what I'm going to show is solely my own. A little bit of history. I've had quite a few jobs. I've well, done this too. It was a security with a telecommunications company. Uh, auditor, support engineer. Okay. And my topics include information security, information security, information security, and information security. And <laughs> that's about it. About my okay, current state. What are we doing? So we have space sponsored attacks. They have a lot of budget, mostly in a limited budget. We have organized uh, hacking teams, you probably heard about them. We have space sponsored hackers that uh, hire uh, additional hackers from Russia, Poland, Europe, Ukraine, America, whatever. Terrorist organizations. And one that shows, probably you've heard of it. Jester is very popular on Twitter. Uh, we have internal, disrupted employees, uh, malicious vendors, hardware, software. Some of them are introducing vendors within their appliances. And we have the so called trusted third parties, vendors that work for our companies or uh, temporary employees. Okay, what are their strengths? As you probably know, Hackers don't go on a job on a 9 to 5 basis. They work all the time. They can enter in a network on Sundays, on Saturdays, they don't care about the weekends. Uh, they have a limited budget, or sometimes they don't even need a budget, they just need a terminal. That's all they need. They have open, open knowledge database, they have the GitHub with uh, Stack Overflow and uh, Control C, Control V, Keyboard. You can program the internet, right? Okay. We have several days that uh, we're not willing to sell. Maybe. <laughs> and we have strong uh, motives financially, political, patriotic, or just for fun. Or we have small teams of security professionals. We have limited times, we have limited budgets, limited tools. We have bureaucratic approvals. We just found out that what we consider is cool and what we consider the fact that we uh, can stop an external attack from entering our networks. Of course, we also have security testing environments. We can't just do tests on production environments because you'll end up upsetting the customer. Okay, someone asked me the other day what do I think about X. Antivirus. Well, my opinion is antivirus days are long gone. The buy antivirus is not working anymore. We have the build framework, we have the backdoor factory, then in the middle framework, let us play PowerShell, uh, BB script. How to make an antivirus fully undetectable? It's equal to zero. You don't need anything, just a Windows or Linux box. That's all it takes. Okay, and what uh, do we have? We have firewalls, we have website filtering, web application firewalls, data leakage protection, CMs, vulnerabilities, and IDS, IDS, and tomorrow. The list can continue forever, but uh, I don't want to bore you anymore. But we can continue like 10 slides. So imagine a team of six or five people, 100 if you have an uh, emergency response team, managing and monitoring all these alerts. And then we take my people. 
and you have to implement various regs or rules that will catch different type formats, log formats. A very personal configuration, huge number of events. We're talking about hundreds, thousands, or even more events that you have to actively monitor. Okay. So we have the stage driver. You should really know about the hype and what you should be really afraid of. It does not affect Romania. You know why? Okay, I'll let me tell you. Because most of us use the iPhone. <laughs> okay, it's cool to have an iPhone. Or if you have an Android, you're mostly likely to have the latest Android. So, yeah. Or Cyanogen mode, or whatever. You like to have the newest and coolest stuff around, the latest updates. So, no, not such a big worry for you. Okay, there's one thing. It was introduced three years ago. No one knew. So, if you had your website posted there, someone might have your private key. Might have your password. Did you change all your passwords? I'm sure <laughs> not all of them. Okay. Uh, well, one website. That doesn't need any protection is the National Health Insurance Company. Right? They don't use a certificate. Why if you are using a password? <laughs> okay. Then there are various zero days, Flash, Twitter, Windows, you name it. Okay. Everyone is mentioning zero days. You are vulnerable. You have the latest tools to detect them or whatever. Hmm. I don't know. We'll see about it. Okay, start being afraid of the right things, your assets. Do you know all your assets that you have in your uh, inventory or your network? No, most probably not. Some of the old server still lying around under a table. Where's the personnel? These are the weakest points of your network. Why? We'll discuss about that later. And mentioning zero days earlier, you have the 6,000 days. What are those? Most probably you have a Windows 2K box in your infrastructure that has not been patched since <laughs> a, long, a long time ago. No support, no everything. Everyone's a code in the company, if you know that. <laughs> okay, they can code, they know almost everything. You just need a notepad. That's all it takes. Windows comes with pre-built tools to compile, execute, whatever you want to do. Availability. We all have families. No one can stay up late at night looking at the alerts. Even if you hire an external company to do it for you. They don't care the way you do, right? Some, uh, some of you may not know, but uh, Windows 7 comes with IP6 enabled. Did you scan your infrastructure for IP6? No? Hmm. Probably do, probably don't. A lot of tools are installed for your know, workstation by default. And I don't mean solitaire or whatever. It comes with PowerShell. Does an employee really need PowerShell? A regular one. Credentials are everywhere. Everyone is putting their credential in notepad, saving it on their desktop. Saving in Outlook notes, I'm not saying you do that, but sometimes they do. You don't use two factor on external websites. Okay? Uh, no encryption, internal. Someone asked me the other day, but if it's internal, how can they read it? Okay? Wireless. Do you monitor all your wireless networks? Okay? Yeah. APT. APT is something that the antivirus companies have invented for failure. Okay? Someone has to say, they failed. <laughs> Goodbye, antivirus. Okay, then you have the unauthorized tools. These are the tools that developers in the company install without security approval. I'm referring to the clips, Wireshark, whatever. Any tool that can be useful for an internal hacking. Questions received over the years. Why do I need security in change management? I know all my systems. 
But we do from that way to scan it, so that's okay. If, they, if, if it's internal, we can get in. And now antivirus, my favorite definition is out today. That is where we stand today. So, there are us, the four, ten guys from security, and there's a bunch of cybernetic armies. China's army measures about 2,000, like so. Hackers, okay. So, traditional ways are not working that's clear. The victory, you probably heard about the fight, the 300 Spartans as well. There were 300 Spartans, right? There were also 700, nobody tells about them. Right? 400 T-Bucks and perhaps a few hundred dollars. I wasn't there, but Wikipedia says so, so it's true. <laughs> Most of them were killed, yeah? <laughs> that battle was lost. Okay, another miss. Another, how do you say? It's a hype. It's a boom to say, prepare, not to prepare for a data breach. You're already breach. So you're waving the flag. Yeah? If you're waving the flag, then it means you lost, right? You are the one who did it. Most probably you are compromised. That is for sure. You can't handle it. With 10 guys, come on. APT, we have an antivirus, we have an APT, right? You can't detect it. But most important is if you are a target. Sure, you get a crypto locker in your network, but how are you really targeted? What I by that, I mean, is someone specifically looking for your data? Maybe stay sponsored of that, but most of the viruses are used for getting bitcoins, uh, extracting Gmail, that's for selling on the black market. Someone, if someone wants your data, your client data, and goes after your financial record, or makes a huge, you want to make a huge transaction, yeah, then you are the target. Yeah. Okay, what you can do? Also, uh, 80% of your uh, problems come from 20% of your issues. So, within a month, let's say, you can close all high critical, almost all higher critical vulnerabilities <coughs> within your network. Exploiting the 20% would require additional skills, but a uh, script TV or an internal employer with average technology skills might not get you. You wouldn't be able to compromise your network. Well, it's okay to fail. Yeah? We all fail. You just have to learn from it. It's not okay not to know <laughs> that you have failed, so your company is breached, and you're waving the white flag and you reach, yeah, okay, boom, or failing over and over. Imagine a sphere, right? This is your network. And from a point to an extremity, you have one line. How many lines can, lines can you have within a sphere? An infinite, right? So that is how your network works. Pretty complex, huh? You have no point communicating to each other. If you do some math, a lot of things. And this is our job, securing the sphere. <coughs> Pretty damn hard, right? Okay, what I'm proposing. Artificial intelligence systems that will start learning from attacks. Successful and unsuccessful attacks. Self-protecting mechanism, just like the human immune body. Shape-shifting networks. Big data, advanced money board, and on the fly patch. I'm going to go through each one of them. With artificial intelligence, maybe all of you have heard, right? Or you've seen the movie. Yeah? <laughs> the self protecting network mechanism will work something like this. When an attacker is successful, it will run. Yeah? What? I'm sorry. It will learn uh, how the, the attack took place, right? And it will add that to its repository. A future attack based on the same principle will be blocked. Or, more important, it will take advantage of the advanced funding bots. What are advanced funding bots? Well, it would be nice for once to be on the other side. How many of you are like that? 
No? <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> but it's better to be aware of now than you are. We can start monitoring their actions and then, based on that decision, put them in a similar virtual network in order for them to scan that fake network similar to production like that. So if you put it there, on, based on how much experience that attack has, right? You can then monitor his activities. He is a skillful one, put it in a more complex network. Gather all the information that he does, all the scanning, all the exploits he's trying, add them to the repository. We mentioned earlier. So, for each level, introduce a new ways to uh, increase the capability of the artificial intelligence system. That will protect your network in the future. So, what I'm saying, don't kick him out. Let him in. And for one, I'll speak like that. <laughs> and for once, try to be on the other side. Someone mentioned earlier that they uh, only need to be lucky once. No. Let them be lucky all the time. Measure what they are doing. And you have to be, <laughs> you will be on the other side, right? You will monitor all their activities. You will know what they are doing. And on the flight actually, this is quite interesting. It's not a uh, matter of science fiction. Uh, okay, we won't get that through. Check out that a uh, cyber bad challenge. The cyber challenges system will be automatically create defenses, deploy matches and mitigations, monitor the network and generate the defenses of competitors. Sounds like something the US or NSA would do, right? So this is what we are creating. Vertical binary and binary and relation automatic patch. It sounds very improbable, impossible, but so far six things have qualified. One amazing thing managed to do this in six hours. So this is quite an impressive. Okay, what you need to start doing because you can't implement all those measures right now, right? But you can start listening. If you already do, that's great. You have CMs, you have logs, you have everything in place. So listen, start building a repository for learning. You may not use it now, but you can use it in the future. When start doing it. Start doing means implementing those. And those, by those I mean using big data, right? Everyone is speaking of it, no one is knowing how to do it. Yeah. So you use big data, you use Elasticsearch, so in, in order to catch all events and then establish automatic alerts and actions based on the attacker's system, uh, actions, right? So when you see that someone is trying to block a robot for exploit, move him into the virtual uh, network where he can play, he can start attacking. He tries another buffer overflow exploit between the virtual uh, network, put him in a separate container, and so on and so on, until you catch him, know where he is, it will give you enough time to establish where the attack location is. Because there are some legal issues if you, you can't attack him right back. If this is your network, he is on the other side, you can't just simply attack his computer. Internet, but if, it, if it, he is in your network, <coughs> you can hack it, you can fight back, right? Okay, so you need to gather all the information, and by all information, I mean all workstation, all servers, all endpoints, mobile devices, I don't know, everything, but it means a really good thing. Everything, everything that is connected to your network, you have to have fully load information. You have to smartly process that information using your new database tool and technologies. You have to identify malicious events and patterns. So, when I was talking about the sphere earlier, when an attacker enters your network, it will create a point and then a connection to another one. If you see all the sphere and the connections it makes, you can establish patterns, right? You can know, you can predict what he is about to do next. 
And my next goal is really not this goal. It's trying to reach the data base, the most valuable assets, right? Because the databases are usually the most important ones. You have to establish automated alerts and actions, right? So yeah, it's good to have a response team, and it's good to establish correct incidents response plan and create production life uh, like environment in order to catch monitor and understand the attacker's way. And this layer will be added to the rest of the layers, all the guys we only have spoken about. Okay, and you need to automate as much as you can. You, we, you must stop doing manual analysis, right? So you have a malware, let's say, within your network, okay, you are loading to virus total, you look for screens, when you put it in another malware, an analyzing tool like Fire or whatever, you then look for the TCP request, you look for the DNS request, right? No, this has to stop. You have to start automating, you have to start introducing automated ways that once you get the malware, it will be blocked on your virtual tree solution, it will be blocked within your network communication network if it's a payload. On HTTPS, detect it, block it, move the attacker away. Okay, it was a short one, but I hope I got you in the right question, uh, in the right position. Where are we headed? Right? We need to start thinking the wrong way. Right? So now, right now, we are trying to protect the boss. You have to get out of the boss and take control of the boss, right? And create them small bosses for real attackers to play with, right? We have to get on the other side. That's why we are white attackers, right? And we try to stop our adversary. You can't fight an army. A terrible army will never stop an invasion, right? These are my thoughts, and I thank you very much for uh, staying. Any questions? How much processing power and uh, storage would need to gather all the information that you might uh, The benefits from implementing such a solution would worth, uh, I don't know, 100 terabytes or so or time. The advantage is that with the new technologies like uh, Elasticsearch, you can do it, uh, you can uh, shoot an alert immediately. So, yeah. You don't have to keep it for, I don't know, 10 years. Because if you detect the attacker and you move it away from your network, okay, your system has learned. So it's gathering from 300 uh, workstations will take, uh, I don't know, hours. Just the uh, event with uh, dealer box, for example, from Windows desktop. Yeah, but it will take hours to keep it. That is correct. And it's a very good question. But you need to understand what blocks you have to take. And you need to understand the attacker's intentions. Because if you look at what most of the companies, let's, let's do it another way. Most of the companies are doing penetration tests, right? I, I would like to know how many of them are keeping the logs and then analyzing them for future learning. Maybe, maybe they'll delete it, right? No, you have to learn what the penetration testing did, what users he created, what tokens you will use and understand the attack. And right, you don't have to take all the roles because you don't need this space, right? <laughs> or so. You only need security related events. And you only need those that come. Okay. okay. And another uh, thing to relate to that virus is yes, right? Regarding the classic uh, uh, naming term and viruses, but the solutions we take are not. For uh, specific uh, viruses, there are um, uh, multi malware uh, solutions. They are not, uh, you're not going to find the 2015 uh, software that will only target the viruses. It will also target the all types of malware. Didn't, can, didn't get the question. So, so you said that anti viruses are obsolete? Yes. Yes, yes they are obsolete, but uh, in terms of uh, 
actual softwares these days, they are not only antiviruses. These are uh, complex solutions that are targeting multiple malware, not only viruses. Okay, and you are referring to malware or APTs? Any kind of uh, what, what you might consider, uh, I don't know, an infectious uh, program or uh, how you're targeted by different. Uh, okay, let, let me ask you with an example. For example, right? So, someone downloads uh, an antivirus or a piece of sol uh, software that is evil, right? That piece of software does specific actions to your system, right? It creates some hidden folders, it creates some registry keys, it opens support, it spawns a shell for the attacker, right? So these are actions that you can understand <coughs> and observe. You can put it then in your repository and the system will learn, right? And once it detects, detects such a pattern, it will block it automatically. It, what I'm saying, the antivirus is that because the traditional antivirus and anti malware is long gone. We have to start thinking that this is a solution. All of them globally taken, yes, they are. But they are, they need to start being as a, considered the final solution. We have to understand the attackers, what they are doing, and then adding that to the report. I hope I answered your questions. Yeah, maybe some of them will detect it. Yes, right? But we need, this is just a part. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, there are uh, lots of other uh, things that you might be exposed to, uh, not only uh, which is the files or infections, uh, but um, there are also complex things <laughs> for desktop to block this. Same. You have to wonder the most and best predict the future attacks. Yes, yes, I can shut the problem. But when I saw your kind of proposal and solutions, they are they are more or like more or less technical. So as the saying goes, uh, you have to think of the, the weakest thing and that's most of the time that the user. And I, my personal view on things is that apart from those topics that you mentioned which are definitely important and quite fan of that grand security challenge and I know of it, is educating your users, educating your employees and how can you reach that. I I, I don't think that you can do something technical in, uh, 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 and solve all the problems that the user may cause. So if, if your user is the weakest link and it doesn't use the factor authentication, it does not. Sorry, it uses, I know, four letter password or if you create a password uh, policy and if that uses the same password over again or that's right somewhere. So, kind of getting everyone aware of the, of the issues and the way how to protect it is, is, I find it very important. Yeah, I'm going to answer that too. You're absolutely right. It has come to my conclusion that you cannot educate the final user. We must stop thinking about this. So, no, you can't train them. You can make them aware, yeah, but do not click on the email. No, they will click it. If they receive an email with do not click, they will for, for sure 99% they will click it. What you need to do is to know that the workstation that Mary is logged on to at 10 in the night doesn't regularly do SQL injection in your database. Right? So, okay, have your four letter password, right? Have your four letter password, but don't do SQL injection. At midnight. If you do ask you an injection at midnight, then something is fishy. I need to move you in a virtual network, play plan, understand your future actions, right? And am I being good? Yeah, yeah, I, I see your point, Marco. I, 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 the way I see it is that users would be kind of, if you, if you, go, if you go for a purely technical approach, I find that risky, then it won't be. Flexible because users change, they do a lot of stuff, all 
Indianas and the Indian thing. So if you go all day, you go, you make a certain point, choose ever stupid. No, 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 I won't do something that is I'm ignoring the user. I don't think that it could come. Yeah. That's that's why you have to let the system alert about the actions. So you have to wait for a while to learn. Yeah. Because that in the end is what artificial intelligence is about, right? You can't just create a system and work, right? You have to teach him how to live. of course people change. Maybe one day uh, someone who is using that computer can change. It will be another position, right? From developer, that will be a CEO. What does a CEO do? I don't know. But he will have other, other actions, right? Yeah. And then the system will learn. And of course, it won't be perfect. No, no, no system can be designed without flaws, right? That is for sure. You won't be 100% secure. Let's say, in the end, and probably you know, a lot of internet trolls will do this. Yeah, but he's gonna uh, take a picture of the screen. Yeah, sure. But if I do that, maybe I can find better, right? Maybe I can take a picture of him too, right? <laughs> maybe he's using a laptop, right? It's my infrastructure. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Oh, okay, these are futuristic ideas, but I think we have to start using the traditional ways of thinking. I uh, seen mentioned earlier the ISO 2K, right? 2K1. Okay, it's a very good standard, but it's only for the processes, right? We have to start moving <laughs> and do something. You just can't fight it because you do not have the budget your adversaries have. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, one thing that I don't understand is uh, the, the idea of learning when uh, when an attacker usually what he does is try something to this company or this entity and then it works well, good, it doesn't, it's done, and the next one will do something different. So, do you really think that there is a guy who does a lot of things the same way each time. I mean, yes, it's the same with the ones, right? Yeah, but yeah, no. they, they do the same thing each time. On, yes, not not necessarily uh, in a inside your network that is visible to you. Uh, so it, it might be the same thing, but it's not on your logs. So I'm not sure that. I fully understand your question. You are saying that if in another company another zero day attacks occurs, right, with new technologies, how will my system uh, protect itself, right? Yes, we can find that there should be a way to. Yeah, because they won't share laws, right? Yeah. No, I'm sharing information. Yeah, but still, if you take a closer look at the attacks, you'll find similar patterns, right? Even if there are zero days or something, there are zero days in the product, in the software, right? There are strings, right? There are strings sent over the network from the TCP right? Or something like that. But in the end, it's detectable, right? So, as I said earlier, if someone is doing Excel or day and no network activity occurs only in Windows update or something, and then detects huge amount of device and traffic when something goes wrong. Yeah, probably you don't know what's happening. But maybe you can take another action, not block it, right? But you can take similar. To drop his request, right? Temporary drop his request. Maybe you drop his shell, right? Asking what did happen. <laughs> did I go the bad it was detected, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I open some minds and <laughs> um, someone will start thinking differently.
because uh, one of uh, the problems that uh, was mentioned in the long list was old mindset. <laughs> yeah, right. So no, uh, no uh, CSO will approve this from the start, right? Yeah. Related? I'm oh, sorry to say that there is no demo. <laughs> no. no. I, I will try to implement as much as I can. Currently, we are automating as much as we can, and we'll start doing this kind of things in the future. And I would like to say yes. This is where I would, would like to go. But again, there is another view that might go. Okay, thank you.